Naked Empire by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 129. Sabar nodded, rising into a half crouch, seeming not to be sure if he was supposed to stand since Richard and Kalen had, or stay seated. Kara hadn't sat down. She stood behind Sabar like an executioner. Kara had been there when the revolution in Al Turang had started and might remember Sabar, but that would make no difference. Kara trusted no one where the safety of Richard and Kalin was concerned. Richard gestured for Sabar to remain seated. Where is she? Richard asked as he and Kalin sat down again, sharing a seat on a bedroll. Is she coming soon? Nietzsche said to tell you that she waited as long as she could, but there have been some urgent developments and she could wait no longer. Richard let out a disappointed sigh. Some things came up for us, too. Kalin had been captured and taken to the Pillars of Creation as bait to lure Richard into a trap. Rather than go into all that, he kept the story short and to the point. We were trying to get to Nietzsche, but needed to go elsewhere. It was unavoidable. Sabar nodded. I was worried when she returned to us and said that you had not shown up at your meeting place, but she told us that she was sure you were busy taking care of something important, and that was the reason you had not come. Victor Caskella, the blacksmith, was very worried too when Nietzsche told us this. He was thinking you would be returning with Nietzsche. He said that other places he knows, places he and Prisca have dealings with for supplies and such, are on the verge of revolt. These people have heard about Al Turang, how the order has been overthrown there, and how people are beginning to prosper. He said that he knows free men in these places who struggle to survive under the oppression of the order, as we once did, and they hunger to be free. They want Victor's help. Some of the brothers in the Fellowship of Order who escaped from Al Turang have gone to these other places to ensure that such revolt does not spread there. Their cruelty in punishing any they suspect of insurrection is costing the lives of many people, both the innocent and those valuable to the cause of overthrowing the imperial order. In order to ensure their control of the gears of governance and to ready the order's defense against the spread of the revolt, brothers of the order have gone to all the important cities. Surely some of these priests have also gone to report to Jigang the fall of Al Turang, of the loss of so many officials in the fighting there, and of the deaths of Brother Narev and many of his close circle of disciples. Jigang already knows of the death of Brother Narev, Jensen said, offering him a cup of water. Sabar smiled his satisfaction at her news. He thanked her for the water, then leaned forward toward Richard and Kalin as he went on with his story. Prisca thinks the order will want to sweep away the success of the revolt in Al Turang that they can't afford to let it stand. He said that instead of worrying about spreading the revolt, we must prepare, make defenses, and have every man stand ready because the order will return with the intent of slaughtering every last person in Al Turang. Sabar hesitated, clearly worried about Prisca's warning. Victor, though, said we should hammer the iron while it is hot and create a just and secure future for ourselves, rather than wait for the order to gather their strength to deny us that future. He says that if the revolt is spreading everywhere, the order will not so easily stamp it out. Richard ran a weary hand across his face. Victor is right. If those in Al Turang try to sit alone as a singular place of freedom in the heart of hostile enemy territory, the order will sweep in and cut out that heart. The Order can't survive on its perverted ideals, and they know it. That's why they must use force to sustain their beliefs. Without that bully of force, the Order will crumble. Jagang spent 20 years creating a system of roads to knit a diverse and fractured old world together into the Imperial Order. That was but part of the means of how he succeeded. Many resisted the rantings of his priests, with roads to swiftly respond to any dissent, though, Jigang was able to react quickly, to sweep in and kill those who openly opposed his new order. More importantly, after eliminating those who resisted the order's teachings, he filled the minds of children who didn't know any better with blind faith in those teachings, turning them into zealots eager to die for what they were taught was a noble cause, 
sacrificed to some all-consuming greater good. Those young men, their minds twisted with the teachings of the order, are now off to the north conquering the new world, butchering any who will not take up their altruistic tenets. But while Jagang and that vast army are to the north, that strength there leaves the order weak here. That weakness is our opportunity and we must capitalize on it. Now, while Jagang and his men are absent, those same roads he built down here will be our means of rapidly spreading the struggle for freedom far and wide. The torch of freedom has been lit by the will of those like you, those in all to wrong who seized liberty for themselves. The flames of that torch must be held high, giving others the chance to see its light. If hidden and insulated, such flames will be extinguished by the order. There may never be another chance in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes to seize control of our own lives. That torch must be carried to other places. Sabar smiled, filled with quiet pride that he had been a part of it all coming to be. I know that Victor would like for others like Prisca to be reminded of such things, of what the Lord Rawl would say about what we must do. Victor wants to talk to you before he goes to these places to pump the bellows, as he put it. Victor said that he awaits your word on how you would move next, on how best to put the white-hot iron to them, again, his words. So Nietzsche sent you to find me. Yes, I was happy to go to you when she asked me. Victor will be happy, too, not only that you are well, but to hear what the Lord Rawl would say to him. While Victor was awaiting word, Richard also knew that absent such word, Victor would act. The revolution did not revolve around Richard. It couldn't to be successful, but around the hunger of people to have their lives back. Still, Richard needed to help coordinate the spreading revolt in order to be sure it was as effective as possible, not just at bringing freedom to those who sought it, but at crumbling the foundation of the order in the old world. Only if they were successful in toppling the rule of the order in the old world would Jagang's attention and many of his men be pulled away from conquering the new world. Jagang intended to conquer the new world by first dividing it. Richard had to do the same if he was to succeed. Only dividing the order's forces could defeat it. Richard knew that with everyone evacuated from Aidendrill, the Imperial Order would now turn its swords on Dahara. Despite the competence of the Daharan troops, they would be overwhelmed by the numbers that Jagang would throw at them. If the Order was not diverted from its cause, or at least divided into smaller forces, Dahara would fall under the shadow of the Order. The Daharan Empire, forged to unite the new world against tyranny, would end before it had really gotten started. Richard had to get back to Victor and Nietzsche so that they could all continue what they had begun, devising the most effective strategy to overthrow the imperial order. But they were running out of time to resolve another problem, a problem they didn't yet understand. I'm glad you found us, Sabar. You can tell Victor and Nietzsche that we need to see to something first, but as soon as we do, we'll be able to help them with their plans. Sabar looked relieved. Everyone will be happy to hear this. Sabar hesitated, then tilted his head, gesturing north. Lord Rall, when I came to find you, following the directions Nietzsche gave me, I went past the area where she was to meet with you, and then I continued coming south. Worry stole into his expression. Not many days ago, I came to a place miles wide that was dead. Richard looked up. He realized that his headache seemed to be suddenly gone. What do you mean, dead? Sabar waved his hand out toward the evening gloom. The area where I was traveling was much like this place. There were some trees, clumps of grass, thickets of brush. His voice lowered. But then I came to a place where everything that grew ended, all at the same place. There was nothing but rock beyond. Nietzsche had not told me that I would come to such a place. I admit I was afraid. Richard glanced to his right, to the east, to the mountains that lay beyond. How long did this dead place last? 
I walked, leaving life behind, and I thought I might be walking into the underworld itself. Sabar looked away from Richard's eyes. Or into the jaws of some new weapon the Order had created to destroy us all. I came to be very afraid, and I was going to turn back. But then I thought about how the Order made me afraid my whole life, and I didn't like that feeling. Worse, I thought about how I would stand before Nietzsche and tell her I turned around rather than go to Lord Rawl as she asked of me, and that thought made me ashamed, so I went on. In several miles I came again to growing things. He let out a breath. I was greatly relieved, and then I felt a little foolish that I had been afraid. Two. That now made two of the strange boundaries. I've been to places like that, Sabar, and I can tell you that I, too, have been afraid. Sabar broke into a grin. Then I was not so foolish to be afraid. Not foolish at all. Could you tell if this dead area was extensive? Could you tell if it was more than just a patch of open rock in that one place? Could you see if it ran in a line, ran in any direction in particular? It was like you say, like a line. Sabar flicked his hand toward the east. It came down out of the far mountains north of that depression. He held his hand flat like a cleaver and sliced it downward in the other direction. It ran off to the southwest, into that wasteland, toward the pillars of creation. Kaylin leaned close and spoke under her breath. That would be almost parallel to the boundary we crossed not far back to the south. Why would there be two boundaries so close together? That makes no sense. I don't know, Richard whispered to her. Maybe whatever the boundary was protecting was so dangerous that whoever placed it feared that one might not be enough. Kaylin rubbed her upper arms but didn't comment. By the look on her face, Richard knew how she felt about such a notion, especially considering that those boundaries were now down. Anyway, Sabar said with a self-conscious shrug, I was happy I did not turn back, or I would have had to face Nietzsche after she had asked me to help Lord Rall, my friend Richard. Richard smiled. I'm glad too, Sabar. I don't think that place you went through is a danger any longer, at least not a danger the way it was once. Jensen could contain her curiosity no longer. Who is this Nietzsche? Nietzsche is a sorceress, Richard said. She used to be a sister of the dark. Jensen's eyebrows went up. Used to? Richard nodded. She worked to further Jagang's cause, but she finally came to see how wrong she had been and joined our side. It was a story he didn't really feel like going into. She now fights for us. Her help has been invaluable. Jensen leaned in even more astonished. But can you trust someone like that? Someone who had labored on behalf of Jagang? Worse, a sister of the dark? Richard, I've been with some of those women. I know how ruthless they are. They may have to do as Jagang makes them, but they're devoted to the keeper of the underworld. Do you really think you can trust with your life that she will not betray you? Richard looked Jensen in the eye. I trust you with a knife while I sleep. Jensen sat back up. She smiled, more out of embarrassment than anything else, Richard thought. I guess I see your point. What else did Nietzsche say, Kalin asked, keen to get back to the matter at hand. Only that I must go in her place and meet you, Sabar said. Richard knew that Nietzsche was being cautious. She didn't want to tell the young man too much in case he was caught. How did she know where I was? She said that she was able to tell where you were by magic. Nietzsche is as powerful with magic as she is beautiful. Sabar said this in a tone of awe. He didn't know the half of it. Nietzsche was one of the most powerful sorceresses ever to have lived. Sabar didn't know that when Nietzsche was laboring toward the end sought by the Order, she was known as Death's Mistress. Richard surmised that Nietzsche had somehow used the bond to the Lord Rall to find him. That bond was loyalty sworn in the heart, not by rote, and its power protected those so sworn from the Dreamwalker entering their minds. Full-blooded Daharans, like Kara, could tell through the bond where the Lord Rall was. 
Kalin had confided to him that she found it unnerving the way Kara always knew where Richard was. Nietzsche wasn't a Haran, but she was a sorceress, and she was bonded to Richard, so she might have been able to manipulate that bond to tell where he was. Sabar, Nietzsche must have sent you to us for a reason, Richard said, other than to say that she couldn't wait for us at our meeting place. Yes, of course, Sabar said as he nodded hastily, as if chagrined to have to be reminded. When I asked her what I was to say to you, she told me that she had to put it all in a letter. Sabar opened the leather flap of the pouch at his belt. She said that when she realized how far away you really were, she was distraught and couldn't take the time to journey to you. She told me that it was important for me to be sure I found you and gave you her letter. She said the letter would explain why she could not wait. With one finger and a thumb, Sabar lifted out the letter, looking as if he were handling a deadly viper instead of a small roll sealed with red wax. Nietzsche told me that this is dangerous, he explained, looking up into Richard's eyes. She said that if anyone but you opened it, I should not be standing too close or I would die with them. Sabar carefully laid the rolled letter on Richard's palm. It warmed appreciably in his hand. The red wax brightened as if lit by a ray of sunlight even though it was getting dark. The glow spread from the wax to envelop the whole length of the rolled letter. Fine cracks raced all across the red wax like autumn ice on a pond breaking up under the weight of a foot placed on it. The wax suddenly shattered and crumbled away. Sabar swallowed. I hate to think of what would have happened had anyone but you tried to open it. Jensen leaned in again. Was that magic? Must have been, Richard told her as he started to unroll the letter. But I saw it fall apart, she said in a confidential tone. Did you see anything else? No, it just all of a sudden crumbled. With a thumb and finger, Richard lifted some of the disintegrated wax from his palm. She probably put a web of magic around the letter and keyed that spell to my touch. If anyone else had tried to break that web to open the letter, it would have ignited the spell. I guess that my touch unlocked the seal. You saw the result of the magic, the broken seal, not the magic itself. Oh, wait! Sabar smacked his forehead with the flat of his palm. What am I thinking? I'm supposed to give you this, too. Shrugging the straps off his shoulders and down his arms, he pulled his pack around onto his lap. He quickly undid the leather thongs and reached inside, then carefully lifted out something wrapped in black quilted material. It was only about a foot tall, but not very big around. By the way Sabar handled it, it appeared to be somewhat heavy. Sabar set the wrapped object on the ground upright in front of the fire. Nietzsche told me that I should give this to you, that the letter would explain it. Jensen leaned in a little, fascinated by the mystery of the tightly wrapped object. What is it? Sabar shrugged. Nietzsche didn't tell me. He made a face that suggested he was somewhat uncomfortable with the way he was in the dark about much of the mission he'd been sent on. When Nietzsche looks at you and tells you to do something, it goes out of your head to ask questions. Richard smiled to himself as he began to unroll the letter. He knew all too well what Sabar meant. Did Nietzsche say anything about who could unwrap that thing? No, Lord Rall. She just said to give it to you, that the letter would explain it. If it had a web around it, like the letter, she would have warned you. Richard looked up. Kara, he said, gesturing at the bundled package sitting before the fire, why don't you unwrap it while Kalen and I read the letter? As Kara sat cross-legged on the ground and started working on the knots in the leather thongs around the black quilted wrap, Richard held the letter sideways a bit so that Kalen could read it silently along with him. Dear Richard and Kalen, I am sorry that I cannot tell you everything right now that I would have you know, but there are urgent matters I must see to, and I dare not delay. Jagang has initiated something I considered impossible. Through his ability as a dreamwalker, he has forced Sisters of the Dark he controls to attempt to create weapons out of people, as was done during the Great War. This is dangerous enough in itself, 
but because Jagang does not have the gift, his understanding of such things is very crude. He is a blundering bull trying to use his horns to knit lace. They are using the lives of wizards as the fodder for his experiments. I don't yet know the exact extent of their success, but I fear to discover the results. More of this in a moment. First, the object I sent. When I picked up your trail and began tracking it to where we were to meet, I discovered this. I believe you have already come across it because it has been touched by a principle involved in the matter or involved with you. The object is a warning beacon. It has been activated, not by this touch, but by events. I cannot overstate the danger it represents. Such objects could only be made by the wizards of ancient times. The creation of such an object required both additive and subtractive magic and required the gift of both to be innate. Even then, they are so rare that I have never actually seen one. I have, however, read about them down in the vaults at the Palace of the Prophets. Such warning beacons are kept viable by a link to the dead wizard who created them. Richard sat back and let out a troubled breath. How could such a link be possible? Kalin asked. He hardly had to read between the lines to be able to tell that Nietzsche was warning him in the gravest possible terms. It has to be linked somehow to the underworld, Richard whispered back. Little points of firelight danced in her green eyes as she stared at him. Kaylin glanced again at Kara as she worked at the knots, pulling off one of the leather thongs around an object linked to a dead wizard in the underworld. Kaylin held up the edge of the letter as she urgently read along with him. From what I know of such warning beacons, they monitor powerful and vital protective shields created to seal away something profoundly dangerous. They are paired. The first beacon is always amber. It is meant to be a warning to the one who caused the breach of the seal. The touch of a principle or one involved with a principle kindles it so it may be recognized for what it is and serve as it was intended, as a warning to those involved. Only after alerting the one it is meant to warn can it be destroyed. I send it to be absolutely certain you have seen it. The precise nature of the second beacon is unknown to me but that beacon is meant for the one able to replace the seal. I don't know the nature of the seal or what it was protecting. Without doubt, though, the seal has been breached. The source of the breach, while not the specific cause activating this beacon, is self-evident. Oh, now wait a minute, Kara said, standing, backing away as if she had released a deadly plague from the black quilting. It isn't my fault this time. She pointed down at it. You told me to this time. The translucent statue Kara had touched before now stood in the center of its unfolded black quilted wrapping. It was the same statue, a statue of Kalin. The statue's left arm was pressed to its side. The right arm was raised, pointing. The statue, in an hourglass shape, looked as if it were made of transparent amber, allowing them to see inside. Sand trickled out of the top half of the hourglass through the narrowed waist into the bottom of the full dress of the Mother Confessor. The sand was still trickling down, just as it had been the last time Richard had seen the thing. At that time, the top half had been more full than the bottom half. Now the top held less sand than the bottom. Kalin's face had gone ashen. When he'd first seen it, Richard wouldn't have needed Nietzsche to tell him how dangerous such a thing was. He hadn't wanted any of them to touch it. When they had first come across it, in a recess of rock beside the trail, looking almost like part of the rock itself, the thing was opaque, with a dull, dark surface, yet it was clearly recognizable as Kalin. It was lying on its side. Kara wasn't pleased to find such a thing and didn't want to leave a representation of Kalin lying about for anyone to find and to pick up for who knew what. Kara snatched it up then 
even though Richard started to yell at her to leave such a thing be. When she picked it up, it started turning translucent. In a panic, Kara set it back down. That was when the right arm had lifted and pointed east. That was when they could begin to see through the thing, to see the sand inside trickling down. The implied danger of the sand running out had them all upset. Kara wanted to pick it up again and turn it over to stop the sand from falling. Richard, not knowing anything about such an object and doubting that so simple a solution would have any beneficial effect, hadn't allowed Kara to touch it again. He had piled rocks and brush around it so no one else would know it was there. Obviously, that hadn't worked. He knew now that Kara's touch had nothing to do with what was happening except to initiate the warning, so he thought to confirm his original belief. Kara put it down. Down? On its side. Like you wanted to do the last time. To see if that will stop the sand. Kara stared at him for a moment and then used the toe of her boot to tip the figure over on its side. The sand continued to run as if it still stood upright. How can the sand do that? Jensen asked, sounding quite shaken. How can the sand still fall? How can it fall sideways? You can see it? Kalen asked. You can see the sand falling? Jensen nodded. I sure can. And I have to tell you, it's giving my goosebumps goosebumps. Richard could only stare at her staring at the statue of Kalen lying on its side. If nothing else, the sand running sideways through the statue had to be magic. Jensen was a pillar of creation, a hole in the world, a pristinely ungifted offspring of Dark and Rawl. She should not be able to see magic. And yet, she was seeing it. I have to agree with the young lady, Sabar said. That's even more frightening than those big black birds that I've seen circling for the last week. Kalen straightened. You've been seeing... When he heard Tom's urgent warning yell, Richard rose up in a rush, drawing his sword in one swift movement. The unique sound of ringing steel filled the night air. The magic did not come out with the sword. Chapter 14 Kalen ducked to the side out of harm's way as Richard pulled his sword free. The distinctive ring of steel being drawn in anger, fused with Tom's warning yell, still echoing through the surrounding hills to send a flash of fright tingling across her flesh. As she stared out into the empty blackness of the surrounding night, her instinct was to reach for her own sword, but she had packed it in the wagon rather than wear it, so as not to raise suspicions about who they might be. Women in the old world did not carry weapons. By the light of the fire, Kalen could clearly see Richard's face. She had seen him draw the Sword of Truth countless times and in a variety of situations, from that very first time when Zed, after giving him the sword, commanded him to draw it, and Richard tentatively pulled it from its scabbard, to times he pulled it free in the heat of battle, to times like this when he drew it suddenly in defense. When Richard drew the sword, he was also drawing its attendant magic. That was the function of the weapon. The magic had not been created simply to defend the sword's true owner, but more importantly, to be a projection of his intent. The sword of truth was not even really a talisman, but rather a tool of the seeker of truth. The true weapon was the rightly named seeker who wielded the sword. The sword's magic answered to him. Each and every one of the times Richard had drawn the sword, Kalen had seen that magic dancing dangerously in his gray eyes. This was the first time he had drawn the sword that she didn't see the magic in his eyes. The raptor's glare was pure Richard. While seeing him draw the sword without seeing its concomitant magic evident in his eyes shocked her, it seemed to surprise Richard even more. For an instant, he hesitated, as if mentally stumbling. 
Before they had time to even wonder what had prompted Tom's warning yell, shadowy shapes slipping through the cover of the nearby trees suddenly stormed out of the darkness and into their midst. The sudden sound and fury of blood-curdling cries filled the night air as men rampaged into the camp, lit at last by firelight. They didn't appear to be soldiers, they weren't wearing uniforms, and they weren't attacking as soldiers would with weapons drawn. Kalin didn't see any of the men brandishing swords or axes or even knives. Weapons or not, there were a lot of men, and they yelled fierce battle cries as if they intended nothing short of bloody murder. She knew, though, that the sudden shock of deafening noise was a tactic designed to render the intended target powerless with fright, making them easier to cut down. She knew because she used such tactics herself. Blade in hand, Richard was fully in his element, focused, resolute, ruthlessly committed, even without his sword's attendant magic. As assailants charged in, the sword, driven by Richard's own wrath, flashed through the air. A flash of crimson light from the fire's flames reflected along the blade's length, lending it a fleeting stain of red. In that charged moment of attack met, there was a split second when Kalin feared that without the sword's magic, it all might go terribly wrong. In an instant, the camp that had been so quietly tense became pandemonium. Although the attackers weren't dressed like soldiers, they were all big, and as they swept in, there was no doubt whatsoever as to their hostile intent. A man rushing onward threw his arms up to seize Richard before his sword could be brought to bear. The sword's tip whistled as it came around, driven by deadly commitment. The blade severed one of the man's raised arms before exploding through his skull. The air above the fire filled with a spray of blood, bone, and brain. Another man lunged. Richard's sword ripped through his chest. In the space of two blinks, two men were dead. The magic at last seemed to slam into Richard's eyes as if finally catching up with his intent. Kalin couldn't make sense of what the men were doing. They attacked without weapons drawn, but they seemed no less fierce for it. Their speed, numbers, and size, and the angry look of them were enough to make most anyone tremble in fright. From the darkness, more men rushed in on them. Kara stepped into the path of the attack, lashing out with her Aegeel. Men cried out in horrifying pain when her weapon made contact, causing hesitation among the attackers. Sabar, knife to hand, tumbled to the ground with one of the men who had seized him from behind. Jensen ducked away from another man, snatching for her hair. As she spun away from him, she slashed his face with her knife. His cries joined a strident chorus of others. Kalin realized that it wasn't just men yelling, but the horses were also screaming in fright. Kara's Aegeel against a bull neck brought a terrifying shriek. Men yelled with effort and shouted orders that were cut off abruptly as Richard's sword tore through them. All the yelling seemed directed at the task of overwhelming the four of them. Kalin understood then what was going on. This was not an attempt to kill, but to capture. For these men, killing would be a great mercy compared to what they intended. Two of the burly men dove across the fire, arms spread wide as if to tackle Richard and Kalin. Kara reached out and seized a fistful of shirt, abruptly spinning one of the two around. She drove her Aegeel into his gut, dropping him to his knees. The other man unexpectedly encountered Richard's sword thrust straight in with formidable muscle driving it. The scream of mortal pain was brief before the sword slashed his throat. Kara, standing above the man on his knees, pressed her Aegeel to his chest and gave it a twist that dropped him instantly. Already, Richard was leaping over the fire to penetrate into the brunt of the attack. As his boots landed with a thud, his sword cut the man atop Sabar nearly in two, spilling his viscera across the ground. The man Jensen had slashed rose up only to be met by her knife driven by desperate fright. She jumped back as he tumbled forward, clutching the base of his throat where she had severed his windpipe. Kara snagged the man Jensen didn't see going for her back. The moored Sith, her face a picture of savage resolve, held her Aegeel to his throat, 
following him to the ground as he choked on his own blood. Then, among the men Richard ripped into, Kalin saw the knives coming out. The men abandoned their failed attempt to bring him down by grabbing and overpowering him and decided instead to knife him. If anything, the threat of the knives served only to further unleash Richard's fury. By the look in his eyes, the sword's magic seemed to be fully engaged in the battle. For an instant, Kalen stood transfixed by the sight of Richard, so ruthlessly committed to self-defense that the act of killing became a graceful manifestation of art, a dance with death. Compared with Richard's fluid movements, the men blundered like bulls. Without wasted motion, Richard slipped among them as if they were statues, his sword delivering unrestrained violence. Each thrust met a vital area of the enemy. Each swing sliced through flesh and bone. Each turn met an attack and crushed it. There was no lost opportunity, no slash that missed, no thrust gone wide, no bobble that only slightly wounded. Each time he spun past the thrust of a blade, met a rush, or turned to a new attack, he cut without mercy. Kalin was furious that she didn't have her sword. There was no telling how many more men there were. She knew all too well what it was like to be helpless and overwhelmed by a gang of men. She started edging toward the wagon. Jensen and Sabar were both tackled by a burly man diving in out of the darkness. As they hit the ground, the man landed atop them, knocking the wind from them. His big hands pinned their wrists to the ground, keeping their knives at bay. Richard's blade swept past with lightning speed, slicing across the man's back, severing his spine. Richard went to a knee as he turned, whipping the sword around to impale another attacker, rushing in at a dead run, trying to get to Richard before he could recover. The look on the man's face was a picture of horrified surprise as he ran instead onto Richard's sword, running it into his own chest up to the hilt. The heavy man atop Jensen and Sabar convulsed, unable to draw a breath as they threw him off. Richard, still on one knee, yanked the sword free as the mortally wounded man fell past him. As another man rushed into camp, looking around, trying to get his bearings, Kara slammed her Aegeal against his neck. As he crumbled, she drove her elbow up to smash the face of a man following the first in, trying to grab her from behind while she was occupied. Crying out, his hands covered crushed bone and gushing blood. She spun and kicked him between the legs. As he fell forward, his hands going to his groin, she broke his jaw with her knee, turned, and dropped a third man by slamming her Aegeal to his chest. Another attacker threw himself at Sabar, knocking him back. Sabar lashed out with his knife, making solid contact. Another man saw the opening and snatched up Nietzsche's letter lying on the ground. Kalin dove for the letter in his fist, but missed as he yanked his hand back before dashing away. Jensen blocked his escape. He straight-armed her as he charged past. Jensen was knocked, reeling, but came around to bury her knife between his shoulder blades. Jensen managed to keep hold of her knife, twisting it forcefully as the man arched his back with a gasp of pain and then a bellow of anger that withered to a wet burble before it was fully out of his lungs. Jensen's knife had found his heart. He staggered, stumbled, and fell onto the fire. The flames whooshed to life as his clothing ignited. Kalin tried to snatch the letter from his fist as he writhed in horrifying pain, but with the intensity of the heat, she couldn't get close enough. It was already too late, though. The letter she and Richard had only had a chance to partially read flared briefly before transforming to black ash that disintegrated and lifted skyward in a roar of flames. Kaylin covered her mouth and nose, gagging on the stench of burning hair and flesh as she was driven back by the heat. Though it seemed like hours of fighting, the assault had only just begun, and already men lay dead everywhere as yet more of the big men joined the attack. As she recoiled from the flames and her futile attempt to recover the lost letter, Kaylin turned again toward the wagon toward her sword. She looked up and saw a man who seemed as big as a mountain charging right at her, blocking her way. He grinned at seeing that he had run down a woman without a weapon. Beyond the man, Kalin saw Richard. Their eyes met. 
he had taken his sword to the bulk of the attack, trying to cut it down before it could get to the rest of them, trying to end it before harm could get to any of the rest of them. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He wasn't close enough to get to her in time. That didn't stop him from trying. Even as he did, Kalin discounted the attempt. He was too far away. The effort was futile. Looking into the eyes of the man she loved more than life itself, she saw his pure rage. She knew that Richard was seeing a face that showed nothing, a confessor's face, as her mother had taught her. And then the racing enemy came between them, blocking their sight of one another. Kalin's vision focused on the man bearing down on her. His arms lifted like a bear lost in a mad charge. His teeth were gritted with determination. A grimace twisted his face in his wild effort to reach her before she could dodge to the side, before she had a chance to escape. She knew he was too close for her to have that chance, and so she didn't waste any effort in a useless attempt. This one had made it past the killing. He had avoided Jensen and Sabar. He had figured his attack to skirt Richard's blade while making it past Kara's Aegeel as she turned to another man. He hadn't charged in madly like the rest. He had delayed just enough to time his onslaught perfectly. This one knew he was on the verge of having what he sought. He was far less than a heartbeat away, plunging toward her at full speed. Kalen could hear Richard's scream even as her gaze met the gleam of the man's dark eyes. The man let out a cry of rage as he lunged. His feet left the ground as he sailed through the air toward her. His wicked grin betrayed his confidence. Kalen could see his eye teeth hooked over his cracked lower lip, saw the dark tooth in the front of the top row between his other yellow teeth, saw the little white hook of a scar, as if he had once been eating with a knife and had accidentally sliced the corner of his mouth. His stubble looked like wire. His left eye didn't open as wide as his right. His right ear had a big V-shaped notch taken out of the upper portion. It reminded her of the way some farmers marked their swine. She could see her own reflection in his dark eyes as her right arm came up. Kalin wondered if he had a wife, a woman who cared for him, missed him, pined for him. She wondered if he might have children, and if he did, what a man like this would teach his children. She had a momentary flash of the ugliness it would be to have this beast atop her, his wire stubble scraping her cheek raw, his cracked lips on hers, his yellow teeth raking her neck as he lost himself in what he wanted. Time twisted. She held out her arm. The man crashed in toward her. She felt the coarse weave of his dark brown shirt as the flat of her hand met the center of his chest. That heartbeat of time she had before he was a topper had not yet begun. Richard had not yet managed to take a single frantic step. The weight of the bear of a man against her hand felt as if it were but a baby's breath. To Kalin, it seemed as if he were frozen in space before her. Time was hers. He was hers. The rush of combat, the cries, the yells, the screams, the stink of sweat and blood, the flash of steel, the clash of bodies, the curses and growls, the fear, the terror, the heart-pounding dread, the rage, was no longer there for her. She was in a silent world all her own. Even though she had been born with it and had always felt it there in the core of her being, the awesome power within, in many ways, seemed incomprehensible, inconceivable, unimaginable, remote. She knew it would seem that way until she let her restraint slip, and then she would once again be joined with a force of such breathtaking magnitude that it could only be fully comprehended as it was being experienced. Although she had unleashed it more times than she could remember, no matter how prepared she was, the extraordinary violence of it always still astonished her. She regarded the man before her with cold calculation, ready for that violence. As he had charged in on her, time had belonged to this man. Now, time belonged to her. 
she could feel the thread count of the fabric of his shirt, feel his woolly chest hairs beneath it. The heart-pounding shock of the sudden attack, the violence of it was gone now. Now there was only this man and her, forever linked by what was to happen. This man had consciously chosen his own fate when he chose to attack them. Her certainty of what was called for carried her beyond the need for the assessment of emotion, and she felt none, no joy, not even relief, no hate, not even aversion, no compassion, not even sorrow. Kalin shed those emotions to make way for the rush of power, to give it free run. Now he had no chance. He was hers. The man's face was contorted with the intoxicated, gloating glee of his certitude that he was the glorious victor who would have her, that he was now the one to decide what was to become of her life, that she was but his to plunder. Kalin unleashed her power. By her deliberate intent, the subordinate state of her birthright instantly altered into overpowering force, able to alter the very nature of consciousness. In the man's dark eyes had come the spark of suspicion that something which he could not comprehend had irrevocably begun. And then there came the lightning recognition that his life, as he had known it, was over. Everything he wanted, thought about, worked toward, hoped for, prayed for, possessed, loved, hated, was ended. In her eyes he saw no mercy, and that, more than anything, brought him stark terror. Thunder without sound jolted the air. In that instant, the violence of it was as pristine, as beautiful, as exquisite, as it was horrific. That heartbeat of time Kalin had before he was on her had still not yet begun. She could see in the man's eyes that even thought itself was too late for him now. Perception itself was being outpaced by the race of brutal magic tearing through his mind, destroying forever who this man had been. The force of the concussion jolted the air. The stars shuddered. Sparks from the fire lashed along the ground as the shock spread outward in a ring, driving dust before its passing. Trees shook when hit by the blow, shedding needles and leaves as the raging waves swept past. He was hers. His full weight flying forward knocked Kalin back a step as she twisted out of the way. The man flew past her and crashed to the ground, sprawling on his face. Without an instant of hesitation, he scrambled up onto his knees. His hands came up in prayerful supplication. Tears flooded his eyes. His mouth which only an instant before was so warped with perverted expectation, now distorted with the agony of pure anguish. Please, mistress, he wailed, command me. Kalin regarded him for the first time in his new life with an emotion, contempt. Chapter 15 only the sound of Betty's soft, frightened bleating drifted out over the otherwise silent campsite. Bodies lay sprawled haphazardly across the ground. The attack appeared to be over. Richard, sword in hand, rushed through the carnage to get to Kalin. Jensen stood near the edge of the fire's light while Kara checked the bodies for any sign of life. Kalin left the man she had just touched with her power kneeling in the dirt, stalking past him toward Jensen. Richard met her halfway there, his free arm sweeping around her with relief. Are you all right? Kalin nodded, quickly appraising their camp, on the lookout for any more attackers, but saw only the men who were dead. What about you? she asked. Richard didn't seem to hear her question. His arm slipped from her waist. Dear spirits, he said, as he rushed to one of the bodies lying on its side. It was Sabar. Jensen stood not far away, trembling with terror, her knife held up defensively in a fist, her eyes wide. Kalin gathered Jensen in her arms, whispering assurance that it was over, that it was ended, that she was all right. Jensen clutched at Kalin. Sabar, he was 
protecting me. I know, I know, Kaylin comforted. She could see that there was no urgency in Richard's movements as he laid Sabar on his back. The young man's arm flopped lifelessly to the side. Kalin's heart sank. Tom ran into camp gasping for air. He was streaked with blood and sweat. Jensen wailed and flew into his arms. He embraced her protectively, holding her head to his shoulder as he tried to regain his breath. Betty bleated in dismay from beneath the wagon, hesitantly emerging only after Jensen called repeated encouragement to her. The puling goat finally rushed to Jensen and huddled, trembling against her skirts. Tom kept a wary watch of the surrounding darkness. Kara calmly walked among the bodies, surveying them for any sign of life. With most, there could be no question. Here and there, she nudged one with the toe of her boot or with the tip of her aegeal. By her lack of urgency, there was no question that they were all dead. Kalin put a tender hand to Richard's back as he crouched beside Sabar's body. How many people must die, he asked in a low, bitter voice, for the crime of wanting to be free, for the sin of wanting to live their own life? She saw that he still held the sword of truth in a white-knuckled fist. The sword's magic, which had come out so reluctantly, still danced dangerously in his eyes. How many, he repeated. I don't know, Richard, Kalin whispered. Richard turned a glare toward the man across the camp, still on his knees, his hands pressed together in a beseeching gesture, begging to be commanded, fearing to speak. Once touched by a confessor, the person was no longer who they had once been. That part of their mind was forever gone. Who they were, what they were, no longer existed. In its place, the magic of a confessor's power placed unqualified devotion to the wants and wishes of the confessor who had touched them. Nothing else mattered. Their only purpose in life now was to fulfill her commands, to do her bidding, to answer her every question. For one thus touched, there was no crime they wouldn't confess if she asked it of them. It was for this alone that confessors had been created. Their purpose, in a way, was the same as the seekers, the truth. In war, as in all other aspects of life, there was no more important commodity for survival than the truth. This man, kneeling not far away, cried in abject misery because Kalin had asked nothing of him. There could be no agony more ghastly, no void more terrifying than to be empty of knowing her wish. Existence without her wish was pointless. In the absence of her command, men touched by a confessor had been known to die. Anything she now asked of him, whether it be to tell her his name, confess his true love's name, or to murder his beloved mother, would bring him boundless joy because he would finally have a task to carry out for her. Let's find out what this is all about, Richard said in a low growl. In exhaustion, Kalin stared at the man on his knees. She was so weary she could hardly stand. Sweat trickled down between her breasts. She needed rest, but this problem was more immediate and needed to be attended to first. On their way to the man waiting on his knees, his eyes turned expectantly up toward Kalin, Richard halted. There in the dirt before his boots was the remains of the statue Sabar had brought to them. It was broken into a hundred pieces, none of them any longer recognizable except that those pieces were still a translucent amber color. Nietzsche's letter had said that they didn't need the statue now that it had given its warning, a warning that Kalin had somehow broken a protective shield sealing away something profoundly dangerous. Kalin didn't know what the seal protected, but she feared that she knew all too well what she had done to break it. She feared even more that because of her, the magic of Richard's sword had begun to falter. As Kalin stood staring down at the amber fragments ground into the dirt, despair flooded into her. Richard's arm circled her waist. 
Don't let your imagination get carried away. We don't know what this is about yet. We can't even be certain that it's true. It could even be some kind of mistake. Kaylin wished that she could believe that. Richard finally slid his sword back into its scabbard. Do you want to rest first? Sit a bit. His concern for her took precedence over everything. From the first day she met him, it always had. Right then, it was his well-being that concerned her. Using her power sapped a confessor of strength. It had left Kaylin feeling not only weak, but this time nauseated. She had been named to the post of mother confessor in part because her power was so strong that she was able to recover it in hours. For others, it had taken a day or sometimes two. At the thought of all those other confessors, some of whom she dearly loved being long dead, Kaylin felt the weight of hopelessness pulling her even lower. To fully recover her strength, she would need a night's rest. At the moment, though, there were more important considerations, not the least of which was Richard. No, she said, I'm all right. I can rest later. Let's ask him what you will. Richard's gaze moved over the campsite littered with limbs, entrails, bodies. The ground was soaked with blood. The stench of it all, along with the still smoldering body beside the fire, was making Kaylin sicker by the second. She turned away from the man on his knees toward Richard into the protection of his arms. She was exhausted. And then let's get away from this place, she said. We need to get away from here. There might be more men coming. Kaylin worried that if he had to draw the sword again, he might not have the help of its magic. We need to find a more secure camp. Richard nodded his agreement. He looked over her head as he held her to his chest. Despite everything, or perhaps because of everything, it felt wonderful simply to be held. She could hear Friedrich just rushing back into camp, panting as he ran. He stumbled to a halt as he let out a moan of astonishment mixed with revulsion at what he saw. Tom, Friedrich, Richard asked, do you have any idea if there are any more men coming? I don't think so, Tom said. I think they were together. I caught them coming up a gully. I was going to try to make it back here to warn you, but four of them came over a rise and jumped me while the rest ran for our camp. I didn't see anyone, Lord Rahl, Friedrich said, catching his breath. I came running when I heard the yelling. Richard acknowledged Friedrich's words with a reassuring hand on the man's shoulder. Help Tom get the horses hitched. I don't want to spend the night here. As the two men sprang into action, Richard turned to Jensen. Please lay out some bedrolls in the back of the wagon, will you? I'd like Kalen to be able to lie down and rest when we move out. Jensen patted Betty's shoulder, urging the goat to follow her. Of course, Richard. She hurried off to the wagon, Betty trotting along close at her side. As everyone rushed as quickly as possible to get their things together, Richard went by himself to an open patch of ground nearby to dig a shallow grave. There was no time for a funeral pyre. A lonely grave was the best they could do, but Sabar's spirit was gone and wouldn't fault the necessity of their hurried care for his body. Kaylin reconsidered her thought. After the letter from Nietzsche and learning the meaning of the warning beacon, she now had even more reason to doubt that many things, including spirits, were still true. The world of the dead was connected to the world of the living by links of magic. The veil itself was magic and said to be within those like Richard. They had learned that without magic, those links themselves could fail, and that, since those other worlds couldn't exist independent of the world of life, but only existed in a relational sense to the world of life, should the links fail completely, those other worlds might very well cease to exist, much as without the sun, the concept of daytime would not exist. It was now clear to Kalin that the world's hold on magic was slipping, and had been slipping for several years. She knew the reason. Spirits, the good and the bad, and the existence of everything else that depended on magic might soon be lost. That meant that death would become final in every sense of the word. 
It could even be that there was no longer the possibility of being with a loved one after death or of being with the good spirits. The good spirits, even the underworld itself, might be passing into nothingness. When Richard was finished, Tom helped him gently place Sabar's body in the ground. After Tom spoke quiet words asking the good spirits to watch over one of their own, he and Richard covered the body over. Lord Rall, Tom said in a low voice when they were finished, while some of the men began the attack on you here, others slit the horses' throats before joining their fellows to come after you four. All the horses? Except mine. My draft horses are pretty big. The men were probably worried about getting trampled. They left some men to take care of me, so these here thought they had me out of the way. They probably figured they could worry about the draft horses later, after they had the rest of you. Tom shrugged his broad shoulders. Maybe they even planned to capture you, tie you up, and take you in the wagon. Richard acknowledged Tom's words with a single nod. He wiped his fingers across his forehead. Kaylin thought he looked worse than she felt. She could see that the headache had returned and was crushing him under the weight of its pain. Tom looked around their camp, his gaze playing over the fallen men. What should we do with the rest of the bodies? The races can have the rest of them, Richard said without hesitation. Tom didn't look to have any disagreement with that. I'd better go help Friedrich finish getting the horses hitched to the wagon. They'll be a handful with the scent of blood in their nostrils and the sight of the others dead. As Tom went to see to his horses, Richard called to Kara. Count the bodies, he told her. We need to know the total. Richard, Kalen asked in a confidential tone after Tom was out of earshot and Kara had started stepping over some of the bodies and between others, going about the task of taking a count. What happened when you drew the sword? He didn't ask what she meant or try to spare her from worry. There's something wrong with its magic. When I drew the sword, it failed to heed my call. The men were rushing in and I couldn't delay in what I had to do. Once I met the attack, the magic finally reacted. It's probably due to the headaches from the gift. They must be interfering with my ability to join with the sword's magic. The last time you had the headaches, they didn't interfere with the sword's power? I told you, don't let your imagination get carried away. This has only happened since I've started getting the headaches again. That has to be the reason. Kalen didn't know if she dared believe him, or if he really even believed it himself. He was right, though. The problem with the sword's magic had only recently developed, after he started getting the headaches. They're getting worse, aren't they? He nodded. Come on. Let's get what answers we can. Kalen let out a tired sigh, resigned to that part of it. They had to use this chance to find out what information was now available to them. Kalen turned to the man still on his knees. Chapter 16 The man's tearful eyes gazed pleadingly up at Kalen as she stepped in front of him. He had been waiting alone and without her wishes for quite a while, and as a result was in a state of dire misery. You are to come with us, Kalen told him in a cold tone. You are to walk in front of the wagon for now where we can keep an eye on you. You will obey the orders of any of the others with me as you would obey my orders. You will answer all questions truthfully. The man fell to his belly on the ground in tears, kissing her feet, thanking her profusely for at last commanding him. Groveling on the ground, with that V-shaped notch in his ear, he reminded her of nothing so much as a swine. Fists at her side, Kalen screamed, Stop that! She didn't want this murdering pig touching her. He sprang back instantly, aghast at the rage in her voice, horror struck that she was displeased with him. He cringed, motionless at her feet, his eyes wide, fearful that he would do something else to displease her. You aren't in a uniform, Richard said to the man. You and the other men aren't soldiers? We're soldiers, just not regular soldiers, the man said with eager excitement to be able to answer the question and thus do Kalin's bidding. 
We're special men serving with the Imperial Order. Special? How are you special? With a hint of uncertainty in his wet eyes, the man looked nervously up at Kalin. She gave him no sign. She had already told him that he was to follow all their orders. The man, at last certain of her intention, rushed to go on. We're a special unit of men with the army. Our task is to capture enemies of the order. We have to pass tests to be sure we're able men, loyal men, and that we can accomplish the missions we're sent on. Slow down, Richard said. You're talking too fast. The man glanced quickly at Kalin, his eyes filling with tears that he might have displeased her, too. Go on, she said. We don't wear uniforms or let our purpose be known, the man said with obvious relief that if he continued it would satisfy her. Usually we work in cities, searching out insurrectionists. We mingle with people, get them to think of us as one of them. When they plot against the order, we go along until we find out the names of all those involved, and then we capture them and turn them over for questioning. Richard stared down at the man for a long time, his face showing no reaction. Richard had been in the hands of the Order and questioned. Kalin could only imagine what he must have been thinking. And do you hand over only those who you know to be plotting against the Order? Richard asked. Or do you simply turn in those you suspect? and anyone who they know. If we suspect they might be plotting, like if they keep to themselves and their own group and won't open their lives to other citizens, then we turn them in to be questioned so that it can be determined what they might be hiding. The man licked his lips, keen to tell them the full extent of his methods. We talk to those they work with or neighbors and get the names of anyone they associate with, any of their friends, sometimes even their closest family members. We usually take at least some of them, too, and turn them over for questioning. When they're questioned, they all confess their crimes against the Order, so that proves our suspicions about them were right. Kalin thought that Richard might draw his sword and behead the man on the spot. Richard knew all too well what they did to those who were brought in, knew how hopeless was their plight. Confessions obtained under torture often provided names of anyone who might be suspicious for any reason, making the job of torturing a very busy profession. The people of the old world lived in constant fear that they would be taken to one of the many places where people were questioned. Those pulled in were rarely guilty of plotting against the order. Most people were too busy just trying to survive trying to feed their families to have time to plot to overthrow the rule of the imperial order. Many people did, however, talk about a better life, about what they would like to do, to grow, to create, to own, about their hopes that their children would have a better life than theirs. Since mankind's duty was sacrificed to the betterment of their fellow man, not to their own betterment, that, to the imperial order, was not just insurrection, but blasphemy. In the old world, misery was a widespread virtue, a duty to a higher calling. There were others who didn't dream of a better life, but dreamed of helping the order by turning in the names of those who spoke ill of the order, or hid food, or even a bit of money, or talked of a better life. Turning in such disloyal citizens kept yet other fingers from pointing at the informer. Informing became an indicator of sanctity. Instead of drawing his sword, Richard changed the subject. How many of you were there tonight? Including me, 28, the man said without delay. Were you all together in one group when you attacked? The man nodded, keen to admit their whole plan and thus gain Kalin's approval. We wanted to make sure you and... and... His eyes turned to Kalin as he realized the incompatibility of his two goals, confessing and pleasing the mother confessor. He burst into tears, clasping his hands prayerfully. Forgive me, mistress, please forgive me. If his voice was the quintessence of emotion, hers was the opposite. Answer the question. He brought his sobbing to a halt in order to speak as he had been commanded. Tears, though, continued to stream down his filthy cheeks. 
We stayed together for a focused attack, so we could be sure that we captured Lord Rahl and... and you, Mother Confessor. When trying to capture a good-sized group, we split up, with half holding back to look for anyone who might try to slip away. But I told the men that I wanted the both of you, and you were said to be together, so this was our chance. I didn't want to run the risk that you would have any hope of fighting us off, so I ordered all the men to the attack, having some cut the throats of the saddle horses first to prevent any possibility of escape. His face brightened. I never suspected that we might fail. Who sent you? Kalin asked. The man shuffled forward on his knees, his hand tentatively coming up to touch her leg. Kalin remained motionless, but by her icy glare let him know that touching her would displease her greatly. The hand backed away. Nicholas, he said. Kalin's brow twitched. She had been expecting him to say Jagang had sent him. She was wary of the possibility that the Dreamwalker might be watching through this man's eyes. Jagang had in the past sent assassins after he had slipped into their thoughts. With Jagang in a person's mind, he dominated and directed them, and even Kara could not control them, nor, for that matter, could Kalin. You're lying to me. Jagang sent you. The man fell to pitiful weeping. No, mistress. I've never had any dealings with His Excellency. The army is vast and far-flung. I take my orders from those in my section. I don't think that the ones they take orders from, or their commanders, or even theirs, are worthy of His Excellency's attention. His Excellency is far to the north, bringing the word of the Order's salvation to a lawless and savage people. He would not even be aware of us. We are but a lowly squad of men with the muscle to snatch people the Order once either for questioning or to silence them. We are all from this part of the Empire, and so we were called upon because we were here. I am not worthy of the attention of His Excellency. But Jagang has visited you in your dreams. He has visited your mind. Mistress? The man looked terrified to have to question her rather than answer her question. I don't understand. Kalin stared. Jagang has come into your mind. He has spoken to you. He looked sincerely puzzled as he shook his head. No, mistress. I have never met His Excellency. I have never dreamed about him. I don't know anything about him, except that all Turang has the honor of being the place where he was born. Would you like me to kill him for you, mistress? Please, if it is your wish, allow me to kill him for you. The man didn't know how preposterous such a notion was. In his desire to please her, though, if she commanded it, he would be only too happy to make the attempt. Kalin turned her back on the man as Richard watched him. She leaned toward Richard a bit as she spoke quietly so the man wouldn't hear. I don't know if those visited by the Dreamwalker must always be aware of it, but I think they would be. The ones I've seen before were mindful of Jagang's presence in their mind. Couldn't the Dreamwalker slip into a person's mind without their being aware of it, just so he could watch us? I suppose it's possible, she said. But think of all the millions of people in the old world. He can't know whose mind to enter so he can watch. Dreamwalker or not, he is only one man. Are you gifted? Richard asked the man. No. Well, Richard whispered, Nietzsche told me that Jagang rarely bothers with the ungifted. She said that it was difficult for him to take the mind of the ungifted, so he simply uses the gifted he controls and has them control the ungifted for him. He has all the sisters he's captured that he has to worry about. He has to maintain his control over them and direct their actions, including what we started to read in Nietzsche's letter about how he's guiding the sisters in altering people into weapons. Besides that, he heads the army and plans strategy. He has a lot of things to manage, so he usually confines himself to the minds of the gifted. But not always. If he has to, if he needs to, if he wants to, he can enter the minds of the ungifted. If we were smart, Kalin whispered, we would kill this man now. As they spoke, Richard's glare never left the man. 
She knew he would not hesitate to agree unless he thought the man might still be of use. I have but to command it, Kalin reminded him, and he will drop dead. Richard took in her eyes for a moment, then turned back to the man and frowned. You said someone named Nicholas sent you. Who is this Nicholas? Nicholas is a fearsome wizard in the service of the Order. You saw him? He gave you these orders? No, we are too lowly for one such as he to bother with us. He sent orders that were passed down. How did you know where we were, Richard asked. The orders included the general area. They said that we should look for you coming north at the eastern edge of the desert wasteland. And if we found you, we were to capture you. How did Nicholas know where we were? The man blinked, as if searching his mind to see if he had the answer. I don't know. We weren't told how he knew. We were told only that we were to search this area, and if we found you, we were to bring you both in, alive. The commander who passed on the orders told me not to fail, or the slide would be very displeased with us. Who would be displeased? The slide? Nicholas the Slide. That is what he's called. Some people just call him the Slide. Frowning, Kalin turned back to the man. The what? The man began trembling at her frown. The Slide, mistress. What does that mean, the Slide? The man fell to wailing, his hands clasped together as he begged her forgiveness. I don't know, mistress. I don't know. You asked who sent me. That is his name, Nicholas. People call him the Slide. Where is he? Richard asked. I don't know, the man blurted out as he wept. I received my orders from my commander. He said that a brother of the order brought the orders to his commander. Richard took a deep breath as he rubbed the back of his neck. What else do you know about this Nicholas, other than that he's a wizard and he's called the Slide? I only know to fear him, as do my commanders. Why? What happens if you displease him? Kalin asked. He impales those who displease him. With the stench of blood and burning flesh, along with the things she was hearing, it was all Kalin could do to keep from being sick. She didn't know how much longer her stomach could take it if they stayed in this place, if this man told her anything else. Kalin gently grasped Richard's forearm. Please, Richard, she whispered. This isn't really getting us anything very useful. Please, let's get out of here. If we think of anything, we can question him more later. Get out in front of the wagon, Richard said without hesitation. I don't want her having to look at you. The man bobbed his head and scrambled away. I don't think Jagang is in his mind, Kalin said. But what if I'm wrong? For now, I think we should keep him alive. Out in front of the wagon, Tom will have a clear view of him. If we are wrong, well, Tom is very quick with his knife. Richard let out a shallow breath. I've already learned something important. What? His hand in the small of her back started her moving. Let's get going and I'll tell you about it. Kalin could see the wagon waiting in the distant darkness. Tom's eyes followed the man as he ran out in front of the big draft horses and stood waiting. Jensen and Kara were in the back of the wagon. Friedrich sat up on the seat beside Tom. How many? Richard called to Kara as they approached the wagon. With the four out in the hills that Tom took care of, and this one here, 28. That's all of them then, Richard said with relief. Kalin felt his hand on the small of her back slip away. He staggered to a halt. Kalin paused beside him, not knowing why he'd stopped. Richard sank to one knee. Kalin dropped down beside him, throwing an arm around him for support. He squeezed his eyes shut in pain. With his arm pressed across his abdomen, he doubled over. Kara leaped over the side of the wagon and raced to their side. Despite how exhausted Kalin was, panic jolted her instantly to full alert. We need to get to the slip, she said to Kara as well as Richard. We need to get to Zed and get some answers and some help. Zed can help. Richard drew labored breaths, unable to speak as he held his breath against a wave of agony. Kalin felt helpless, not knowing what to do to help him. Lord Rall, Kara said, kneeling before him, you have been taught to control pain. 
You must do that now. She seized a fistful of his hair and lifted his head to be able to look into his eyes. Think, she commanded. Remember, put the pain in its place. Do it. Richard clutched her forearm as if to thank her for her words. Can't, he finally managed to say to Kaylin through his obvious suffering. We can't go in the sliff. We must, she insisted. The sliff is the fastest way. And if I step down into the sliff, breathe in that quicksilver creature, and my magic fails? Kaylin was frantic. But we must go in the sliff. To get there in a hurry, she feared to say, in time. And if anything is wrong, I'll die, he panted, trying to catch his breath against the pain. Without magic, breathing the sliff is death. The sword is failing me. He swallowed, coughed, gasped for breath. If my gift is causing the headaches, and that's making magic falter in me, and I enter the sliff, I will be dead after I take the first breath. There's no way to test it. An icy wave of terror shot through her veins. Getting to Zed was Richard's only hope. That had been her plan. Without help, the headaches of the gift would kill him. She feared, though, that she knew why the magic of his sword was failing, and it wasn't the headaches. She feared that it was, in fact, the same thing that had caused the seal to be broken. The warning beacon testified that she was the cause of that. If it was true, then she was the cause of that and much more. If she was right, she realized. If it was true, then Richard was right about the sliff. Going into the sliff would indeed be death. If she was right, then he wouldn't even be able to call the sliff much less travel by it. Richard Rall, if you're going to throw mud on my best ideas, then you had better have an idea of your own to offer in its place. He was gasping now in the clutch of violent pain, and then Kalen saw blood when he coughed. Richard! Tom, looking alarmed, raced up beside them. When he saw the blood running down Richard's chin, he turned ashen. Help him to the wagon, Kalen said, trying to keep her voice steady. Kara put her shoulder under his arm. Tom circled an arm around Richard and helped Kalen and Kara lift him to his feet. Nietzsche, Richard said. What? Kalen asked. You wanted to know if I had an idea. Nietzsche, he gasped in pain and struggled to get his breath. Yet more blood came when he coughed. It was dripping off his chin. Nietzsche was a sorceress, not a wizard. Richard needed a wizard. Even if they had to travel overland, they could race there. But Zed would be better able... Zed is too far, he said. We need to get to Nietzsche. She can use both sides of the gift. Kalen hadn't thought of that. Maybe she really could help. Halfway to the wagon, Richard collapsed. It was all they could do to hold up his dead weight. With Tom gripping him under the backs of his shoulders and Kara and Kalen each holding a leg, they ran the rest of the way to the wagon. Tom, without the need of help from Kara and Kalen, hoisted Richard into the back of the wagon. Jensen hurriedly unfurled another bedroll. They laid Richard out as carefully as they could. Kalen felt as if she were watching herself react, move, talk. She refused to allow herself to give in to panic. Kalen and Jensen tried to lean in to see how he was, but Kara shoved them back out of the way. She bent over Richard, putting her ear to his mouth, listening. Her fingers felt for a pulse at the side of his throat. Her other hand cupped the back of his neck, no doubt preparing to hold him to give him the breath of life if she had to. Mord Sith were knowledgeable about such things. They knew how to keep people alive in order to extend their torture. Kara knew how to use that knowledge to help save lives, too. He's breathing, Kara said as she straightened. She laid a comforting hand on Kalen's arm. He's breathing easier now. Kalen nodded her thanks, unwilling to test her voice. She moved in closer to Richard, on the other side, while Kara wiped the blood from his chin and mouth.
Kalin felt helpless. She didn't know what to do. We'll ride all night, Tom said over his shoulder as he climbed up into the driver's seat. Kalin forced herself to think. They had to get to Nietzsche. No, she said. It's a long way to Alturang. We're not near any roads. Picking our way cross country in the dark is foolhardy. If we're reckless and push too hard, we'll just end up killing the horses. Or they could break a leg, which would be just as bad. If we lose the horses, we can't very well carry Richard all the way and expect to make it in time. The wisest thing to do is to go just as fast as we possibly can. But we also have to get rest along the way to be ready should we be attacked again. We have to use our heads or we'll never make it. Page 167. Jensen held Richard's hand in both of hers. He has that headache, and he fought all those men. Maybe if he can just get some sleep, he'll be better then. Kaylin was buoyed by that thought, even though she didn't think it was that simple. She stood in the wagon bed, looking out at the man waiting for her to command him. Are there any more of you? Any more sent to attack us or capture us? Did this Nicholas send anyone else? Not that I'm aware of, mistress. Kalin spoke softly to Tom. If he even looks like he's going to cause any trouble, don't hesitate. Kill him. With a nod, Tom readily agreed. Kalin dropped back down and felt Richard's brow. His skin was cold and wet. We'd best go on until we find a place that will be easier to defend. I think Jensen is right that he needs rest. I don't think bouncing around in the back of this wagon is going to help him. We'll all need to get some rest and then start out at first light. We need to find the horse, Kara said. The wagon is too slow. If we can find the horse, I'll ride like the wind, find Nietzsche, and start back with her. That way we don't have to wait all the way until we get there in the wagon. Good idea. Kalin looked up at Tom. Let's get going. Find a place to stop for the night. Tom nodded as he threw off the brake. At his urging, the horses heaved their weight against the hames, and the wagon lurched ahead. Betty, puling softly, lay beside an unconscious Richard and put her head down on his shoulder. Jensen stroked Betty's head. Kalin saw tears running down Jensen's cheeks. I'm sorry about Rusty. Betty's head came up. She let out a pitiful bleat. Jensen nodded. Richard will be all right, she said, her voice choked with tears as she took Kalin's hand. I know he will. Chapter 17 Zed thought he heard something. The spoonful of stew he was about to put into his waiting mouth paused. He remained motionless, listening. The keep often had sounded alive to him, as if... It even sounded as if it were letting out a small sigh. Ever since he was a boy, Zed had, on occasion, heard loud snaps that he never could trace. He suspected such sounds were most likely the massive stone blocks moving just a tad, popping as they yielded ground against a neighbor. There were stone blocks down in the foundations of the keep that were the size of small palaces. Once, when Zed was no more than ten or twelve, a loud crack had rung through the entire keep as if the place had been struck with a giant hammer. He ran out of the library where he'd been studying to see other people coming out of rooms all up and down the hall, looking about, whispering their worries to one another. Zed's father had later told him that it was found to be nothing more than one of the huge foundation blocks cracking suddenly, and while it posed no structural problem, the abrupt snap of such an enormous piece of granite had been heard throughout the keep. Although such occurrences were rare, it was not the last time he heard such a harmless but frightening sound in the keep. And then there were the animals. Bats flew unrestricted through parts of the keep. There were towers that soared to dizzying heights, some empty inside but for stone stairs curving up around the inside of the outer wall on their way up to a small room at the top, or an observation deck, in the dusty streamers of sunlight penetrating the dark interiors of those towers, there could be seen myriad bugs flitting about. The bats loved the towers. Rats, too, lived in parts of the keep. 
They scurried and squeaked, sometimes causing a fright. Mice were common in places, making noise, scratching and gnawing at things. And then there were the cats, offspring of former mousers and pets, but now all wild that lived off the rats and the mice. The cats also hunted the birds that flew in and out of uncovered openings to feed on bugs or to build nests up in high recesses. There were sometimes awful sounds when a bat, a mouse, a bird, or even a cat went somewhere they weren't permitted. The shields were meant to keep people away from dangerous or restricted areas, but they were also placed to prevent unauthorized access to many of the items stored and preserved in the keep. The shields guarded against life. They made no distinction between human and non-human life. Otherwise, after all, a pet dog that innocently wandered into a restricted area could theoretically retrieve a dangerous talisman and proudly take it to a child master who could be put in peril by it. Those who placed the shields were aware that it was also possible for unscrupulous people to train animals to go to restricted areas, snatch whatever they might be able to carry, and bring it to them. Not knowing what animal might potentially be trained for such a task, the shields were made to ward all life. If a bat flew into the wrong shield, it was incinerated. There were shields in the keep that even Zed could not get through because they required both sides of the gift, and he had only the additive. Some of the shields took the form of a barrier of magic that physically prevented passage in some way, either by restricting movement or by inducing a sensation so unpleasant that one couldn't force oneself beyond. Those shields were meant to prevent ungifted people or children from entering certain areas, not to prevent entrance to the gifted, so it was not necessary for those shields to kill. But such shields only worked for those who were ungifted. In other places, entrance was strictly forbidden to anyone but those with not only the appropriate ability, but proper authority. Without both the appropriate ability and authority granted by spells keyed to the particular defenses in that area, such as metal plates that had to be touched by an authorized wizard, the shields killed whatever entered them. The shields killed animals as infallibly, as effectively, as they would kill any intruder. Such dangerous shields gave warnings of heat, light, or tingling as a warning so as to prevent people from unintentionally going near them. After all, with the size of the place, it was easy enough to become lost. Such warnings worked for the animals, too, but occasionally a cat chased a panicked mouse into a lethal shield, and sometimes the cat, racing after, would run right into it as well. As Zed waited, listening, the silence stretched on unbroken. If he really had heard something, it could have been the keep moving, or an animal squeaking when it approached a shield, or even a gust of wind coming through one of the hundreds of openings. Whatever it was, it was silent now. The wooden spoonful of stew finally completed its journey. Um, Zed declared to no one in particular, good. To his great disappointment when he'd first tasted it, he had found that the stew wasn't done. Rather than hurry the process with a bit of magic and possibly incur Addie's wrath for meddling with her cooking, Zed had sat down on the couch and resigned himself to doing a bit of reading. There was no end to the reading. Books offered the potential of valuable information that could aid them in ways they couldn't foretell. From time to time, as he read, he checked the progress of the stew. Rather patiently, he thought. Now, as he tasted it, it finally seemed to be done. The chunks of ham were so tender, they would fall apart when his tongue pressed them to the roof of his mouth. The whole delightfully bubbling pot had taken on the heady melding of onions and oils, carrots and turnips, a hint of garlic, and a dizzying swirl of complimentary spices, all crowded with nuggets of ham, some still with crisp fat along one edge. To his great annoyance, Zed had long ago noticed that Addie hadn't made any biscuits. Stew went well with biscuits. There should be biscuits. He decided that a bowl of stew would hold him until she returned and made some. There should be biscuits. It was only right. He didn't know where Addie had gone. Since he had been down in Aidendrill most of the day, 
He reasoned that she had probably gone off to one of the libraries to search through books for anything that might be of help. She was a great help ferreting potentially relevant books out of the libraries. Being from Nicobaris, Addy sought out books in that language. There were books all over the keep, so there was no telling where she was. There were also storerooms filled with racks and racks of bones. Other rooms contained rows of tall cabinets, each with hundreds of drawers. Zed had seen bones of creatures there that he had never seen in life. Addie was an expert of sorts on bones. She had lived for a good portion of her life in seclusion in the shadow of the boundary. People living in the area had been afraid of her. They called her the Bone Woman because she collected bones. They had been everywhere in her house. Some of those bones protected her from the beasts that came out of the boundary. Zed sighed. Books or bones, there was no telling where she was. Besides that, there were any number of other things in the wizard's keep that would be of great interest to a sorceress. She might even have simply wanted to go for a walk or up on a rampart to gaze at the stars and think. It was much easier to wait for her to come back to her stew than for him to go looking for her. Maybe he should have put one of the bells around her neck. Zed hummed a merry tune to himself as he spooned stew into a wooden bowl. No use waiting on an empty stomach, he always said. That only made a person grouchy. It was really better to have a snack and be in good humor than to wait and be miserable. He would only be bad company if he was miserable. On the eighth spoon of stew into the bowl, he heard a sound. His hand froze above the bubbling pot. Zed thought he'd heard a bell tinkle. Zed wasn't given to flights of imagination or to being unreasonably jumpy, but a cold shiver tingled across his flesh as if he'd been touched by the icy fingers of a spirit reaching out from another world. He stood motionless, partly bent toward the pot in the fire, partly turned toward the hall, listening. It could be a cat. Maybe he hadn't tied the thin cord high enough, and as a cat went under the line, its tail had swished up and rung the bell. Maybe a cat was being mischievous, and as it sat on its haunches, tail swishing back and forth, it had batted a bell. It could be a cat. Or maybe a bird had landed on the line to roost for the night. A person couldn't get past the shields in order to trip a belled cord. Zed had placed extra shields. It had to be an animal, a cat or a bird. If so, if no one could get past the regular shields and the extras he had placed, then why had he strung bells? Despite the likely explanations, his hair was trying to stand on end. He didn't like the way the bell had rung. There was something about the character of the sound that told him it wasn't an animal. The sound had been too firm, too abrupt too quick to stop. He realized fully now that a bell had in fact rung. He wasn't imagining it. He tried to recreate the sound in his mind so that he might be able to put shape to the form that had tripped the cord. Zed silently set the bowl down on the side of the granite hearth. He rose up, listening with an ear turned toward the passage from where he had heard the bell. His mind raced through a map of all the bells he'd placed. He needed to be sure. He slipped through the door and into the passageway, the back of his shoulder brushing the plastered wall as he moved down to the first intersection on his right, watching not just ahead but behind as well. Nothing moved in the hallway ahead. He paused, leaning ahead to take a quick glance down the hall to the right. When he found it clear, he took the turn. Zed moved quickly past closed doors past a tapestry of vineyards that he had always thought was rather poorly executed, past an empty door to a room with a window that looked out over a deep shaft between towers on a high rampart, and past three more intersections until he reached the first stairway. He swept around the corner to the right, up the stairs that curved around to the left as they climbed up, and crossed over the hall he'd just been in. In this way, he could head back toward a network of halls where he'd placed a web of bells without using those same halls. Zed followed a mental map of a complex tangle of passages, halls, rooms, and dead ends that over a lifetime he had come to know intimately. 
Being first wizard, he had access to every place in the keep except those places that required subtractive magic. There were a few places where he could get confused, but this was not one of them. He knew that unless someone was following in his footsteps, they would have to either go back or pass a place where he had set traps of elaborate magic as well as simple string. Then, if they didn't see the cord, they would ring another bell. Then he would be sure. Maybe it was Addie. Maybe she simply hadn't seen the inky cord stretched across a doorway. Maybe she had been annoyed that he'd strung bells, and maybe she'd rung one just to vex him. No, Addie wasn't like that. She might shake her finger at him and deliver a scathing lecture on why she didn't agree with him that stringing bells was an effective thing to do, but she wouldn't pull a trick about something she would recognize as intended to warn of danger. No. Addie might possibly have accidentally rung the bell, but she wouldn't have rung it deliberately. Another bell rang. Zed spun to the sound and then froze. The bell had come from the wrong direction, from where he'd set a bell on the other side of a conservatory. It was too far from the first for anyone to have made it this soon. They would have had to go up a tower stairway, across a bridge to a rampart, along a narrow walkway in the dark, past several intersections to the correct turn that would descend a spiral ramp and make it down through a snarl of passageways in order to break the cord. Unless there was more than one person. The bell had chimed with a quick jerk and then clattered as it skittered across stone. It had to be a person tripping over the cord and sending the bell skipping across the stone floor. Zed changed his plan. He turned and raced down a narrow passageway to the left, climbing the first stairwell, running up the oak treads three at a time. He took the right fork at the landing, raced to the second circular stairwell of cut stone, and climbed as fast as his legs would carry him. His foot slipped on the narrow wedges of spiraling steps and he banged his shin. He paused to wince only for a second. He used the time to consult his mental map of the keep, and then he was moving again. At the top, he dashed down a short paneled hall, sliding to a stop on the polished maple floor. He shouldered open a small, round-topped oak door. A starry sky greeted him. He sucked deep drafts of cool night air as he raced along the narrow rampart. He paused twice along the way to peer down through the slots in the crenellated battlements. He didn't see anyone. That was a good sign. He knew where they had to be if they weren't moving by an outer route. He ran on across the swaying span between towers, robes flying behind, crossing over the entire section of the keep where both bells had rung far below, going over the top of the area in order to get behind whoever had tripped the cords. While they had tripped bells on opposite sides of the conservatory, they had to have come in through the same wing. He knew that much. He wanted to get behind them, bottle them in before they could get to an unprotected section where they would encounter a bewildering variety of passageways. If they were to make it there and hide in that area, he could have a time of rooting them out. His mind raced as fast as his feet as he tried to think, tried to recall all the shields, tried to figure out how someone could have gotten past the defenses to get to that specific wing where the bells that had rung were placed. There were shields that should have made it impossible. He had to consider thousands of corridors and passageways in the keep, trying to come up with all the potential routes. It was like a complex, multi-level puzzle, and despite how thorough he'd been, it was possible he'd missed something. He had to have missed something. There were rooms, or even entire sections, that were shielded and could not be entered, but often they could be circumvented. Even if a hall was shielded at both ends, such as to prevent anyone from getting to the rooms in that hall, you could still usually get around to the other end of the hall and make your way to whatever lay beyond. That was deliberate. While the rooms might have held dangerous items of magic that had to be kept contained, there needed to be ways to get to them and get beyond to other rooms that might, from time to time, also have to be restricted. Most of the keep was like that, a three-dimensional maze with almost endless possible routes. For the unwary, 
It could also be a killing field of traps. There were places layered with warning barriers and other devices that would keep any innocent person away. Beyond those protective layers, the shields gave no warning before they killed. Trespassers would not know there were shields embedded beyond and that they were stepping into a trap. Such shields were designed that way in order to kill invaders who penetrated that deep. The lack of warning was deliberate. Zed supposed it was possible for someone to bypass all the shields and work their way into the depths of the place in order to ring those particular bells, but for the life of him, he couldn't trace all the steps necessary. But whoever it was, no matter how lucky they were, they would soon get themselves stuck in the labyrinth. And then, if they weren't killed by a shield, he could deal with them. Zed gazed out past towers, ramparts, bridges, and open stairs to rooms projecting from soaring walls out on the city of Adendril far below, now all dark and dead-looking. How had someone gotten past the stone bridge up to the keep? A sister of the dark, maybe. Maybe one of them had figured out how to use subtractive magic to take his shield down. But even if one had, the shields in the keep were different. Most of them had been placed by the wizards in ancient times, wizards with both sides of the gift. A sister of the dark would not be able to breach such shields. They had been designed to withstand enemy wizards of that time. They were far more powerful than any mere sister of the dark. And where was Addy? She should have been back. He wished now that he had gone and found her. She needed to know that there was someone in the keep. Unless she already knew unless they had her. Zed turned and raced down the rampart. At the projecting bastion, he seized the railing to the side to halt his forward rush and spin himself around the corner. He raced down the dark steps as if he were running down a hill. With his gift, he could sense that there was no one in the vicinity. Since there was no one near, that meant that he had managed to get behind them. He had them trapped. At the bottom of the steps, he threw open the door and flew into the hallway beyond. He crashed into a man standing there waiting. Zed's momentum knocked the big man from his feet. They fell in a tangle, sliding together along the polished green and yellow marble floor, both grappling for control. Zed could not have been more surprised. His gifted sense told him the man was not there. His gifted sense was obviously wrong. The disorientation of encountering a man when he had sensed that the hall was empty was more jarring than the headlong tumble. Even as he was rolling, Zed was casting webs to tangle the man in a snare of magic. The man, in turn, lunged to tangle Zed in meaty arms. In desperation, despite the close range, Zed pulled enough heat from the surrounding air to unleash a thunderous blast of lightning and cast it directly into the man. The blinding flash burned a lacing line through the stone block wall beyond him. Only too late did Zed realize that the discharge of deadly power had lanced through the man without effect. The hall filled with shards of stone whistling about, ricocheting from walls and ceilings, skipping along the floor. The man landed on Zed, driving the wind from him. Desperately yelling for help, the man wrestled Zed on the slippery floor. Zed concocted a weak and fumbling defense to give the man a false sense of confidence until he was able to suddenly land a knee sharply at the point of his attacker's sternum. The man cried out in surprise as much as in pain as he flipped backward off Zed, gasping to get his wind back. Having sucked so much heat from the air had left it as frigid as a winter night. Clouds of their breath filled the cold air as both men panted from the effort of the struggle. The man again cried out for help, hoping to bring comrades to his aid. Zed would assume that anyone would fear to attack a wizard by muscle alone. This man, though, had no need to fear magic. Even if he hadn't known that before, certainly the evidence was now all too clear. Yet despite the man being at least twice the size of his opponent, less than a third his age, and having immunity from the conjuring being thrown at him, Zed thought that he fought rather squeamishly. However timid the man was, he was determined. He scrambled to the attack again. 
If he broke Zed's neck, it wouldn't matter that he did so timidly. As the man regained his feet and lunged, Zed drew back his arms, elbows cocked, fingers spread, and cast more of the lightning, but this time he knew better than to waste his effort trying to cut down a man not touched by magic. Instead, Zed sought to rake the floor with the conjured bolts of power. It slammed into the stone with unrestrained violence, ripping and splintering whole sections, throwing sharp, jagged shards streaking through the air. A fist-sized block of stone, hurtling at tremendous speed, crashed into the man's shoulder. Above the boom of thunderous power, Zed heard bones snap. The impact spun the man around and knocked him back against the wall. Since Zed now knew that this intruder could not directly be harmed by magic, he instead filled the hall with a deafening storm of magic, designed not to assail the man directly, but to tear the place apart into a cloud of deadly flying fragments. The man, as he recoiled from striking the wall, again threw himself at Zed. He was met by a shower of deadly shards whistling through the air toward him. Blood splattered across the wall beyond as the man was ripped to shreds. In a blink, he was killed and dropped heavily to the floor. From beyond the smoke and dust filling the hall, two more men suddenly flew at Zed. His gifted sense told him that, like the first man, these men were not there either. Zed threw yet more lightning to rip up the floor and unleash flying stone at the men, but they were already through the flares of power diving onto him. He crashed to his back, the men atop him. They seized his arms. Zed struggled frantically to let loose a blast to bring down the ceiling. He began to whirl the air above the men to tear the hall to pieces and them with it. A beefy hand with a filthy white rag clamped down over Zed's face. He gasped, only to inhale a powerful smell that made his throat want to clench shut, but too late. With the cloth and the big hand covering his whole face, Zed couldn't see. The world spun sickeningly. Soft, silent blackness pressed in around him as he fought to resist it until he lost consciousness. Chapter 18 Zed woke, his head spinning, his stomach heaving with rippling waves of nausea. He didn't think that in his entire life he had ever felt so sick. He hadn't known it was possible to feel so intense an urge to vomit without actually throwing up. He couldn't lift his head. If he could just die right then, it would be a welcome release from such dizzying agony. He started to put his hands over the light hurting his eyes, but found his wrists were tied behind his back. I think he's waking, a man said in a subservient voice. Despite his nausea, Zed instinctively tried to use his gift to sense how many people were around him. For some reason, his gift that ordinarily flowed as easily as thought, as simply as using his eyes to see, his ears to hear, felt thick and slow as if mired in molasses. He reasoned that it was probably the result of whatever vile substance it was they had soaked the rag in to cause him to pass out when held over his face. Still, he managed to sense that there was only one person around him. Powerful hands seized his robes and yanked him to his feet. Zed gave himself permission to vomit. Against all expectation, it didn't happen. The dark night swam before his blurred vision, he could make out trees against the sky, stars, and the looming black shape of the keep. Suddenly, a tongue of flame ignited in midair. Zed blinked at the unexpected brightness. The small flame, wavering with a lazy motion, floated above the upturned palm of a woman with wiry gray hair. Zed saw other people in the shadows. His gifted sense was wrong. Like the man who had attacked him, these two had to be people not affected by magic. The woman standing before him peered at him intently, her expression twisted with satisfied loathing. Well, 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 she said with patronizing delight. The great wizard himself awakes. Zed said nothing. It seemed to amuse her. Her fearsome scowl and humped nose, lit from the side by the flame she held above her palm, floated closer. You are ours now, she hissed. 
Zed, having waited patiently to gather his resolve, abruptly initiated the required mental twist to the gift all the way down to his soul in order to simultaneously call down lightning, focus air to slice this woman in two, and gather every stone and pebble from all around to crush her under an avalanche of rock. He expected the night to light with such power as he unlocked and sent forth. Nothing happened. Not waiting to waste the time to analyze what could be the difficulty, he was forced to abandon attempts at satisfying his emotional preferences and to ignite wizard's fire itself to consume her. Nothing happened. Not only did nothing happen, but it felt as if the attempt itself were but a pebble falling endlessly into a vast, dark well. The expectation withered in the face of what he found within himself, a kind of dreadful emptiness. Zed felt as if he couldn't light a tongue of flame to match hers if his life depended on it. He was somehow cut off from forming his ability into much of anything useful other than to use it for a bit of dim awareness. Probably a lingering result of the foul-smelling substance they had pressed over his face to make him lose consciousness. Since Zed couldn't muster any power, he did the only thing he could. He spit in her face. With lightning speed, she backhanded him, knocking him from the arms of the men holding him. Unable to use his hands to break his fall, he hit the ground unexpectedly hard. He lay in the dirt for a time, his ears ringing in the after-effect of the hit he'd taken, waiting for someone to lean over and kill him. Instead, they hauled him to his feet again. One of the men seized his hair and pulled his head up, forcing him to look into the woman's face. The scowl he saw there looked like it spent a great deal of time on her face. She spit in his face. Zed smiled. So, here we have a spoiled child playing the game of tit for tat. Zed grunted with the sudden shock of a wallop of pain that twisted inside of his abdomen. Had the men not been holding him under his arms, he would have doubled over and fallen to the ground. He wasn't quite sure how she had done it, probably with a fist of air delivered with all the power of her gift behind it. She had left the gathered air loosely formed, rather than focusing it to a sharp edge, or it would have torn him in two. As it was, he knew it would leave his middle black and blue. It was a long and desperate wait before he was able to at last draw a breath. The men who his gift said weren't there pulled him straight. I'm disappointed to discover I'm in the hands of a sorceress who could be no more inventive than that, Zed mocked. That brought a smile to her scowl. Don't you worry, Wizard Sarander. His Excellency very much wants your scrawny hide. He will be playing a game of tit for tat that I believe you will find quite inventive. I have learned that when it comes to inventive cruelty, His Excellency is peerless. I'm sure he will not disappoint you. Then what are we standing around for? I can't wait to have a word with His Excellency. As the men held his head back for her, she ran a fingernail down the side of his face and across his throat, not hard enough to draw blood, but enough to hint at her own restrained cruelty. She leaned in again, one eyebrow lifted in a way that ran a chill up Zed's spine. I imagine you have grand ideas about such a visit, about what you think you will do or say. She reached out and hooked a finger around something at his neck. When she gave it a firm tug, he realized that he was wearing a collar of some sort. By the way it dug into the flesh at the back of his neck, it had to be metal. Guess what this is, she said. Just guess. Zed sighed. You really are a tedious woman, but I imagine you've heard that oft times before. She ignored his jibe, eager to be the messenger of bad news. Her scowling smile widened. It's a Radahan. Zed's sense of alarm rose, but he kept any trace of it from his face. Really? He paused for an extended bored yawn. Well, I'd not expect a woman of your limited intellect to think up something clever. She slammed a knee into his groin. Zed doubled over in pain, unable to contain his groan. He hadn't been expecting something so crude. 
The men pulled him up straight, not allowing him pause to recover. Being pulled up straight brought a gasp of agony. His teeth were clenched, his eyes were watering, and his knees wanted to buckle, but the men held him upright. Her smile was getting annoying. You see, Wizard Zorander, being clever isn't necessary at all. Zed saw her point, but didn't say so. He was already preparing to unlock the cursed collar from his neck. He had been captured before by the prelate herself and had had a Radahan put around his neck like some boy born with the gift who needed training. The Sisters of the Light put such a collar around those boys so that the gift wouldn't harm them before they could learn to control their gift. Richard had been captured and put in such a Radahan right after his gift came to life in him. The collar was also used to control the young wizard wearing it, to give pain when the sisters thought it necessary. Zed understood the prelate's reasons for wanting Richard's help, since they knew he had been born with both sides of the gift, and too they worried about the dark forces that pursued him, but he could never forgive her for putting Richard in a collar. A wizard needed to be trained by a wizard, not some misguided gaggle like the Sisters of the Light. The prelate, though, had harbored no delusion of actually training Richard to be a wizard. She had collared him in order to smoke out the traitors among her flock, the Sisters of the Dark. Unlike Richard, though, Zed knew how to get such a disgusting contrivance off his neck. In fact, he had done it before when the prelate had thought to collar him and thus force his cooperation. Zed used a thread of power to probe at the lock, not overtly, so as this woman might notice it, but just enough to find the twist in the spell where he would be able to focus his ability to snap the conjured lock. When the time was right, when he had his feet solidly under him, when his head stopped spinning long enough, he would break the collar's hold. In that same instant, before she knew what had happened, he would release wizard's fire and incinerate this woman. She hooked a finger under the collar again and gave it another tug. The thing is, my dear wizard, I would expect that a man of your renowned talent might know how to get such a device off. Really, I'm renowned? Zed flashed her a grin. That's very gratifying. Her utter contempt brought her a smile of pure disdain. With her finger through the collar, she pulled him close to her twisted expression. She ignored his words and went on. Since His Excellency would be extremely displeased should you get the collar off, I've taken measures to ensure that such a thing would not happen. I used subtractive magic to weld it on. Now that was a problem. She nodded to the men. Zed glanced to them at each side and noticed for the first time that their eyes were wet. It shocked him to realize they were weeping. Weeping or not, they followed her orders, unceremoniously lifting him and heaving him in the back of a wagon as if he were firewood. Zed landed beside someone else. Glad to see you be alive, old man, a soft voice rasped. It was Addie. The side of her face was swollen and bleeding. It looked like they'd clubbed her nearly to death. Her wrists were tied behind her back as well. He saw, too, tears on her cheeks. It broke his heart to see her hurt. Addie, what did they do to you? She smiled. Not as much as they intend to, I fear. In the dim light of a lantern, Zed could see that she, too, wore one of the awful collars. Your stew was excellent, he said. Addie groaned. Please, old man, do not mention food to me right now. Zed cautiously turned his head and saw more men waiting in the darkness off to the side. They had been behind him, so he hadn't noticed them before. His gift had not told him they were there. I think we're in a great deal of trouble, he whispered to no one in particular. Really, Addie rasped. What be your first clue? Zed knew she was only trying to make him smile, but he could not even manage a small one. I be sorry, Zed. He nodded as best he could, lying on his side with his wrists bound behind his back. I thought I was so clever, laying every kind of trap I could think of. Unfortunately, such traps didn't work for those who are not affected by magic. 
You could not know of such a thing, Eddie said in a comforting tone. His mood sank into bitter regret. I should have taken it into account after we encountered that one down at the Confessor's Palace in the spring. I should have realized the danger. He stared off into the darkness. I served our cause no better than a fool. But where did all of them come from? She looked on the verge of losing herself to panic. I have never encountered a single such person in my entire life, and now there'd be a whole gang of them standing there. Zed hated to see Addie so distraught. Addie only knew there were a number of them by the telltale sounds they made. At least he could see the men with his eyes, if not his gift. The men stood around, heads hanging, waiting to be commanded. They didn't look pleased by what was happening. They all looked young in their twenties. Some were crying. It seemed strange to see such big men weeping. Zed almost regretted killing one of them. Almost. You three, the woman growled to more of the men waiting in the shadows as she lifted another lantern from one of them and sent the flame she held into it. Get in there and start the search. Addie's completely white eyes turned to Zed, her expression grave. Sister of the dark, she whispered. And now they had the keep. Chapter 19 And just how can you be sure that it was a sister of the dark you saw? Verna asked absently as she dipped her pen again. She scrawled her initials at the bottom of the request for a sister to travel to a town down south to see to a local sorceress's plans for a defense of their area. Even in the field, the paperwork of the office of the prelate seemed to have chased after and found her. Their palace had been destroyed, the prophet himself was at large, and the real prelate was off alone chasing after him. Some of the sisters of the light had pledged their souls to the keeper of the underworld, and in so doing had brought the keeper a step closer to having them all in the dark forever of eternity, and a good number of the sisters, both sisters of the light and sisters of the dark, were in the cruel hands of the enemy and doing his bidding. The barrier separating the old and new world was down. The whole world had been turned upside down. The only man, Richard Rall, whom prophecy named as having a chance of defeating the threat of the imperial order, was off who knew where doing who knew what, and yet the paperwork managed to survive it all and persist to vex her. Some of Verna's assistants handled the paperwork and the requests, but as much as she disliked dealing with such tedious matters, Verna felt a sense of duty to keep an eye on it all. Besides, as much as paperwork vexed her, it also occupied her mind, preventing her from dwelling on the might have been. After all, Verna added, it could just as easily have been a sister of the light. Jagang uses both for her ability with magic. You can't really be sure it was a sister of the dark. He's been sending sisters to accompany his scouts all winter and spring. The moored Sith placed her knuckles on the small desk and leaned in. I'm telling you, Prelate, it was a sister of the dark. Verna saw no point in arguing, since it mattered little, so she didn't. If you say so, Ricca. Verna turned over the paper to the next in the stack, a request for a sister to come and speak to children on the calling of the Sisters of the Light, with a lecture on why the Creator would be against the ways of the Imperial Order, and on their side. Verna smiled to herself, imagining how Zed would fume at the very idea of a sister in the new world lecturing her views on such a subject. Ricca withdrew her knuckles from the desk. I thought you might say as much. Well, there you go then, Verna mumbled as she read the next message from the Sisters of the Light to the South, reporting on the passes through the mountains and the methods that had been used to seal them off. Wait right here, Ricca growled before flying out of the tent. I'm not going anywhere, Verna said with a sigh as she scanned the written account, but the fiery blonde-headed woman was already gone. Verna heard a commotion outside the tent. Ricca was delivering a scathing lecture to someone. The moored Sith was incorrigible. That was probably why, despite everything, Verna liked her. Since Warren had died, Verna's heart was no longer in much of anything, though. 
She did as she had to, did her duty, but she couldn't make herself feel anything but despair. The man she loved, the man she had married, the most wonderful man in the world was gone. Nothing much mattered after that. Verna tried to do her part, to do as she was needed, because so many people depended on her, but if truth be told, the reason she worked herself nearly to death was to try to keep her mind occupied, to think of something else, anything else, except Warren. It didn't really work, but she kept at it. She knew that people counted on her, but she just couldn't make herself truly care. Warren was gone. Life was empty of what mattered most to her. That was the end of it, the end of her caring about much of anything. Verna idly pulled her journey book from her belt. She didn't know what made her do so, except perhaps that it had been some time since she had last looked for a message from the real prelate. Anne was having her own crisis of caring ever since Kalin had laid the blame for so much of what had gone wrong, including being the cause of the war itself, right at the prelate's feet. Verna thought that Kalin had been wrong about much of it, but she understood all too well why she thought that Anne had been responsible for tangling up their lives. Verna had felt the same way for a time. Holding the journey book off to the side with one hand, flipping the pages with a thumb, Verna saw a message flash by. Rika swept back into the tent. She plunked the heavy sack down on Verna's desk right on top of the reports. Here, Rika said, fury powering her voice. It was then, when Verna looked up, that she saw for the first time the strange way Rika was dressed. Verna's mouth fell open. Rika was not wearing the skin-tight red leather that the moored Sith typically wore, except for occasionally when they were relaxing, and then they sometimes wore brown leather instead. Verna had never seen the woman in anything other than those leather outfits. Now, Rika had on a dress. Verna could not remember being so astonished. But not just a dress, but a pink dress that no decent woman of Rika's age, probably her late twenties or early thirties, would be caught dead in. The neckline plunged down to reveal ample cleavage. The twin mounds of exposed flesh were shoved up and nearly spilling out the top. Verna was amazed that Rika's nipples had managed to remain covered, what with the way her breasts heaved with her heated breathing. You too, Rika snapped. Verna finally looked up into Rika's blazing blue eyes. Me too what? You too can't get enough of looking at my chest? Verna felt her face go scarlet. She gave her red face an excuse by shaking a finger at the woman. What are you doing dressed like that in an army camp around all these soldiers? You look like a whore. Despite how their leather outfits went all the way up to their necks, the tight leather left little to the imagination. Seeing the woman's flesh, though, was altogether different and quite shocking. Verna realized only then, because she had finally looked up at the woman's face, that Rika's single braid was undone. Her long blonde hair was as free as a horse's mane. Verna had never seen one of the moored Sith out in public without her hair done up in the single braid that in large part identified their profession of moored Sith. Even seeing the woman's cleavage exposed was not as shocking as seeing her hair undone. It was that, more than anything, Verna realized, that lent a lewd look to the woman. Something about her braid being undone seemed sacrilegious, even though Verna could not condone a profession dedicated to torture. Verna remembered, then, that she had asked one of the moored Sith, Kara, to do her worst to the young man, a boy, really, who had murdered Warren. Verna had sat up the entire night listening to that young man scream his life away. His suffering had been monstrous, and yet it had not been nearly enough to suit her. At times, Verna wondered if in the next life, the Keeper of the Underworld would have something wholly unpleasant in store for her for all eternity in recompense for what Verna had done. She didn't really care. It had been worth whatever the price might be. Besides, she decided, if she was to be punished for condemning that man to just retribution, then the very concept of justice would have to be invalid, rendering living a life of good or evil to have no meaning. 
In fact, for the justice she had meted out to that vile, amoral animal walking the world of life in the form of a man who had murdered Warren, she should be rewarded in the afterlife by being eternally in the warmth of the Creator's light, along with the good spirit of Warren, or else there was no justice. General Meifert swept into the tent, fists at his sides, coming to a halt beside Rika. He raked his blonde hair back when he saw Verna sitting behind her little desk and cool visibly. He'd had the carpenters nail together the tiny desk for her out of scrap furniture left in an abandoned farm. It was nothing like the desks at the Palace of the Prophets, of course, but it had been given with more concern and meaning behind it than the grandest gold-leafed desk she had ever seen. General Meifert had been proud at seeing how useful Verna found it. With a quick glance, he took in Rika's dress and her hair. What's this about? Well, Verna said, I'm not sure. Something about one of Jagang's sisters scouting a pass. Rika folded her bare arms atop her nearly bare bosom. Not just a sister, but a sister of the dark. Jagang has been sending sisters scouting the passes all winter, the young general said. The prelate has laid traps and shields. His level of concern rose. Are you telling us that one of them got through? No, I'm telling you that I went hunting for them. Verna frowned. What are you talking about? We lost half a dozen Mord Sith trying that. After you found the heads of two of your sister Mord Sith mounted on pikes, the Mother Confessor herself ordered you to stop throwing their lives away on such useless missions. Rika at last smiled. It was the kind of satisfied smile, especially coming from a moored Sith, that tended to give people nightmares. Does this look useless? Rika reached into her sack and pulled out a human head. Holding it by the hair, she brandished it in front of Verna's face. She turned, shook it at General Meifert as well, and then plunked it down on the desk. Gore oozed out over the report. Like I said, a sister of the dark. Verna recognized the face, even as twisted in death as it was. Rika was right. It was a sister of the dark. The question was, how did she know it was a sister of the dark and not one of the light? Outside, Verna could hear horses clopping past her tent. Some of the soldiers called out greetings to men returning from patrols. In the distance could be heard conversations and men issuing orders. Hammers on steel rang like bells as men worked hot metal into useful shapes for repairs to equipment. Nearby, horses frisked in a corral. As men made their way past Verna's tent, their gear jingled. Fires crackled as wood was added for the cooks, or roared as bellows pumped to turn it white hot for the blacksmiths. You touched her with your Aegeal? Verna asked in a quiet voice. Your Aegeal doesn't work effectively on those the Dreamwalker controls. Rika's smile turned sly. She spread her arms. Aegeal? Do you see an Aegeal? Verna knew that no moored Sith would ever let her Aegeal out of her control. With a glance to the woman's cleavage, she could only imagine where she had it hidden. All right, General Meifert said, his tone no longer indulgent. I want to know what's going on, and I want to know right now. I was down near Dobbin Pass, checking around. And what do I find but an Imperial Order patrol? The general nodded as he let out a frustrated sigh. They've been coming in that way from time to time. But how did you manage to come across such an enemy patrol? Why hadn't one of our sisters already snared them? Rika shrugged. Well, this patrol was still on the other side of the pass, back at that deserted farm. She tapped Verna's desk with her toe. Where you got the wood for this? Verna twisted her mouth with displeasure. Rika wasn't supposed to be beyond the pass. The moored Sith, though, recognized no orders but those from Lord Rahl himself. Rika had only followed Kalin's orders because, during his absence, Kalin was acting on Richard's behalf. Verna suspected that it was simpler than that, though. She suspected that they had only followed the Mother Confessor's orders because she was wife to Lord Rahl. And if they didn't, it would bring Lord Rahl's wrath down on them. As long as such orders weren't viewed by the Mord Sith as troublesome, they went along. When they decided otherwise, they did as they wished. The sister was by herself, 
Rika went on, having one powerful-looking headache. Jagang, Verna said. Jagang was issuing his order or punishing her for something or giving her a lecture in her mind. He does that from time to time. It isn't pleasant. Rika stroked the hair on the woman's head sitting on Verna's desk, making a mess of the report. The poor thing, she mocked. While she was off among the pines, staring at nothing while she pressed her fingers to her temples, her men were back at the farmhouse, having their way with a couple of young women. The two were squealing and crying and carrying on, but the men weren't put off by it any. Verna lowered her eyes as she let out a heavy breath. Some people had refused to believe the necessity of fleeing before the arrival of the Imperial Order. Sometimes, when people refused to recognize the existence of evil, they found themselves having to face precisely that which they had never been willing to admit existed. Rika's satisfied smile returned. I went in and took care of the brave soldiers of the Imperial Order. They were so distracted, they paid no attention as I snuck up behind them. The women were so terrorized that they screamed even though I was saving them. The sister hadn't been paying any attention to the screaming before, and didn't then either. One of the young women was blonde and about my size, so an idea struck me. I put on her dress and took out my braid so I might be mistaken for her. I gave the one girl some of the men's clothes to wear and told them both to run for the hills in the opposite direction of the sister and not to look back. I didn't have to tell them twice. Then I sat down on a stool outside the barn. Sure enough, in a while, the sister came back. She saw me sitting there hanging my head, pretending to be crying. She thought the other woman was still inside with the men. She said, it's time those foolish bastards in there were done with you and your friend. His Excellency wants a report and he wants it now. He's ready to move. Verna came up out of her chair. You heard her say that? Yes. Then what? General Myford asked. Then the sister made for the side door into the barn. When she stormed past me, I rose up behind her and cut her throat with one of the men's knives. General Myford leaned toward Rika. You cut her throat? You didn't use your agile? Rika gave him a look that suggested she thought he hadn't been paying attention. Like the prelate said, an agile doesn't work very well on those the Dreamwalker controls. So I used a knife. Dreamwalker or not, cutting her throat worked just fine. Rika lifted the head before Verna again. One of the reports stuck to the bottom of it as it swung by the hair. I sliced the knife through her throat and around her neck. She was thrashing about quite a bit, so I had a good hold on her as she died. All of a sudden, there was an instant when the whole world went black. And I mean black. Black is the keeper's heart. It was as if the underworld had suddenly taken us all. Verna looked away from the head of a sister she had known for a very long time and had always believed was devoted to the Creator, to the light of life. She had been devoted instead to death. The Keeper came to claim one of his own, Verna explained in a quiet voice. Well, Rika said rather sarcastically, Verna thought, I didn't think that when a sister of the light died such a thing happened. I told you it was a sister of the dark. Verna nodded. So you did. General Myfert gave the moored Sith a hurried clap on the back of the shoulder. Thanks, Rika. I'd better spread the word. If Jagang is starting to move, it won't be many days before he's here. We need to be sure the passes are ready when his force finally gets here. The passes will hold, Verna said. She let out a silent sigh. At least for a while. The Order had to come across the mountains if they were to conquer Dahara. There were few ways across those formidable mountains. Verna and the sisters had shielded and sealed those passes as well as it was possible to seal them. They had used magic to bring down walls of rock in places, making the narrow roads impassable. In other places, they had used their power to cleave away roads cut into the steep sides of mountains, leaving no way through except to clamber over rubble. To prevent that, and in other places, the men had worked all winter constructing stone walls across the passes. Atop those walls were fortifications from which they could rain down death on the narrow passes below. Additionally, in every one of those places, 
the sisters had set snares of magic so deadly that coming through would be a bloody ordeal that would only get worse, and that was before they encountered the walls lined with defenders. Jagang had Sisters of the Dark to try to undo the barriers of both magic and stone, but Verna was more powerful, in the additive anyway, than any of them. Besides that, she had joined her power with other sisters in order to invest in those barriers magic that she knew would prove formidable. Still, Jagang would come. Nothing Verna, her sisters, and the Daharan army could do would ultimately be able to withstand the numbers Jagang would throw at them. If he had to command his men to march through passes filled a hundred feet deep with their fallen comrades, he would not flinch from doing so. Nor would it matter to him if the corpses were a thousand feet deep. I'll be back a little later, Verna, the general said. We'll need to get the officers and some of the sisters together and make sure everything is ready. Yes, of course, Verna said. Both General Meifert and Rika started to leave. Rika, Verna called. She gestured down at the desk. Take the dear departed sister with you, would you please? Rika sighed, which nearly spilled her bosom out of the dress. She made a long-suffering face before snatching up the head and vanishing out of the tent behind the general. Verna sat down and put her head in her hands. It was going to start all over again. It had been a long and peaceful, if bitterly cold, winter. Jagang had made his winter encampment on the other side of the mountains, far enough away that with the snow and cold, it was difficult to launch effective raids against his troops. Just as it had the summer before, the summer Warren had died, now that the weather was favorable, the order would begin to move. It was starting all over again. The killing, the terror, the fighting, running, hunger, exhaustion. But what choice was there other than to be killed? In many ways, life had come to seem worse than death. Verna abruptly remembered then about the journey book. She worked it out of the pocket in her belt and pulled the lamp closer, needing the comfort as well as the light. She wondered where Richard and Kaylin were, if they were safe, and she thought too about Zed and Addie all alone guarding the wizard's keep. Unlike everyone else, at least Zed and Addie were safe and at peace where they were, for the time being anyway. Sooner or later, Dahara would fall, and then Jagang would return to Aidendril. Verna tossed the small black book on the desk, smoothed her dress between her legs, and scooted her chair closer. She ran her fingers over the familiar leather cover on an object of magic that was over 3,000 years old. The journey books had been invested with magic by those mysterious wizards who so long ago had built the Palace of the Prophets. A journey book was twinned, and as such, they were priceless. What was written in one appeared at the same time in its twin. In that way, the sisters could communicate over vast distances and know important information as it happened, rather than weeks or even months later. And the real prelate had the twin to Verna. Verna herself had been sent by Anne on a journey of nearly 20 years to find Richard. Anne had known all along where Richard had been. It was for that reason that Verna could understand Kalin's rage at how Anne had seemed to twist her and Richard's life. But Verna had come to understand that the prelate had sent her on what was actually a mission of vital importance, one that had brought change to the world, but also brought hope for the future. Verna opened the journey book, holding it a little sideways to see the words in the light. Verna, Anne wrote, I believe I have discovered where the prophet is hiding. Verna sat back in surprise. After the palace had been destroyed, Nathan, the prophet, had escaped their control and had since been roaming free, a profound danger. For the last couple of years, the rest of the Sisters of the Light had believed that the prelate and the prophet were dead. Anne, when she'd left the palace of the prophets with Nathan on an important mission, had feigned their deaths and named Verna prelate to succeed her. Very few people other than Verna, Zed, Richard, and Kalin knew the truth. During that mission, however, Nathan had managed to get his collar off and escape Anne's control. There was no telling what catastrophe that man could cause. Verna leaned over the journey book again. I should have Nathan within days now. 
I can hardly believe that after all this time I nearly have my hands on that man. I will let you know soon. How are you, Verna? How are you feeling? How are the sisters and how go matters with the army? Write when you can. I will be checking my journey book nightly. I miss you terribly. Verna sat back again. That was all there was. But it was enough. The very notion of Anne finally capturing Nathan made Verna's head swim with relief. Even that momentous news, though, failed to do much to lift her mood. Jagang was about to launch his attack on Dahara, and Anne was about to finally have Nathan under control, but Richard was somewhere off to the south beyond their control. Anne had worked for 500 years to shape events so that Richard could lead them in the battle for the future of mankind, and now, on the eve of what could very well prove to be that final battle, he was not there with them. Verna drew the stylus out of the journey book spine and leaned over to write Anne a report. My dearest Anne, I'm afraid that things here are about to become very unpleasant. The siege of the passes into Dahara is about to begin. Chapter 20 The sprawling corridors of the People's Palace, seat of power in Dahara, were filled with the whisper of footsteps on stone. Anne pushed herself back a little on the white marble bench where she sat stuffed between three women on one side and an older couple on the other, all gossiping about what people were wearing as they strolled the grand halls, or what other people did while they were here, or what they most wanted to see. Anne supposed that such gossip was harmless enough and probably meant to take people's minds off the worries of the war. Still, it was hard to believe that at such a late hour people would rather be out gossiping than in a warm bed asleep. Anne kept her head down and pretended to be pawing through her travel bag while at the same time keeping a wary eye on the soldiers passing not too far away as they patrolled. She didn't know if her caution was necessary, but she would rather not find out too late that it was. Come from far? The closest woman beside her asked. Anne looked up, realizing that the woman had spoken to her. Well, yes, I guess it has been a bit of a journey. Anne put her nose back in her bag and rummaged in earnest, hoping to be left alone. The woman, middle-aged, with her curls of brown hair just starting to carry a bit of gray, smiled. I'm not all that far from home myself, but I do so like to spend a night at the palace now and then, just to lift my spirits. Anne glanced around at the polished marble floors, the glossy red stone columns below arches, decorated with carved vines that supported the upper balconies. She gazed up at the skylights that allowed the light to flood in the place during the day and peered off at the grand statues that stood on pedestals around a fountain with life-sized stone horses galloping forever through a shimmering spray of water. Yes, I see what you mean, Anne murmured. The place didn't lift her spirits. In fact, the place made her as nervous as a cat in a doghouse with the door closed. She could feel that her power was frighteningly diminished in this place. The People's Palace was more than any mere palace. It was a city all joined together and under countless roofs atop a huge plateau. Tens of thousands of people lived in the magnificent structure and thousands more visited it daily. There were different levels to the palace itself, some where people had shops and sold goods, others where officials worked, some that were living quarters. Many sections were off-limits to those who visited. Sprawled around the base of the plateau were informal markets where people gathered to buy, sell, and trade goods. On the climb all the way up through the interior of the plateau to reach the palace itself, Anne had passed many permanent shops. The palace was a center of trade, drawing people from all over Dahara. More than that, though, it was the ancestral home of the House of Rawl. As such, it was grand for arcane reasons beyond the awareness or even understanding of most of the people who called it home or visited it. The People's Palace was a spell. Not a place spelled, as had been the Palace of the Prophets, where Anne had spent most of her life, the place itself was the spell. 
The entire palace had been built to a careful and precise design, that of a spell drawn on the face of the ground. The outer fortified walls contained the actual spell form, and the major congregations of rooms formed significant hubs, while the halls and corridors themselves were the drawn lines, the essence of the spell itself, the power. Like a spell being drawn in the dirt with the point of a stick, the halls would have had to have been built in the sequence required by the specific magic the spell was intended to invoke. It would have been enormously expensive to build it in that manner, ignoring the typical requirements of construction and accepted methods of the trade of building, but only by doing so would the spell work, and work it did. The spell was specific. It was a place of safety for any Rawl. It was meant to give a Rawl more power in the place and to leech power away from anyone else who entered. Anne had never been in a place where she felt such a waning of her Han, the essence of life and the gift within. She doubted that in this place her Han would for long be vital enough to light a candle. Anne's jaw dropped in astonishment as another element of the spell abruptly occurred to her. She looked out at the halls, part of the lines of the spell, filled with people. Spells drawn with blood were always more effective and powerful, but when the blood soaked into the ground, decomposed and dissipated, the power of the spell would often fade as well. But this spell, the drawn lines of the spell itself, the corridors, were filled with the vital living blood of all the people moving through them. Anne was struck dumb with awe at such a brilliant concept. So you're renting a room then? Anne had forgotten the woman beside her, still staring at her, still holding the smile on her painted lips. Anne forced herself to close her mouth. Well, Anne finally admitted, I haven't actually made arrangements yet as to where I will sleep. The woman's smile persisted, but it looked as if it was taking more and more effort all the time. You can't curl up on a bench, you know. The guards won't allow it. You have to rent a room or be put out at night. Anne understood then what the woman was driving at. To these people, most dressed in their finest clothes for their visit to the palace, Anne must look like a beggar in their midst. After all the gossip about what people were wearing, this woman must have been disconcerted to find herself beside Anne. I have the price of a room, Anne assured her. I just haven't found where they are yet, that's all. After such a long journey, I meant to go there right away and get myself cleaned up, but I just needed to rest my weary feet for a bit first. Could you tell me where to find the rooms to rent? The smile looked a little easier. I'm off to my own room and I could take you. It isn't far. That would be kind of you, Anne said, as she rose now that she saw the guards moving off down the corridor. The woman stood, bidding her two benchmates a good night. If Anne was tired, it was only from being caught up in the afternoon devotion to the Lord Rawl. A bell in an open square had tolled, and everyone had moved to gather there and bow down. Anne had noticed then that no one missed the devotion. Guards moved among the crowd, watching people gather. She felt like a mouse being watched by hawks, so she joined with the other people moving toward the square. She had spent nearly two hours on her knees on a hard clay tile floor, bowed down with her forehead touching the ground like everyone else, repeating the devotion in concert with all the other somber voices. Master Rawl, guide us. Master Rawl, teach us. Master Rawl, protect us. In your light we thrive, in your mercy we are sheltered, in your wisdom we are humbled. We live only to serve, our lives are yours. Twice a day, those in the palace were expected to go to the devotion. Anne didn't know how people endured such torture. Then she remembered the bond between the Lord Rawl and his people that prevented the Dreamwalker from entering their minds, and she knew how they could endure it. She herself had briefly been a prisoner of Emperor Jagang. He murdered a sister right before her eyes just to make a point. In the face of brutality and torture, she guessed that she knew how people endured a mere devotion. For her, though, such a spoken devotion to the Lord Rawl, to Richard, was hardly necessary. 
She had been devoted to him for nearly 500 years before he had even been born. Prophecy said that Richard was their only chance to avoid catastrophe. Anne peered carefully around the halls. Now she just needed the prophet himself. This way, the woman said, tugging at Anne's sleeve. The woman gestured for Anne to follow her down a hallway to the right. Anne pulled her shawl forward, covering the pack she carried, and hugged her travel bag closer as she followed along the wide corridor. She wondered how many people sitting on benches and low marble walls around fountains were gossiping about her. The floor had a dizzying pattern of dark brown, rust, and pale tan-colored stone running across the hall in zigzag lines meant to look three-dimensional. Anne had seen such traditional patterns before, down in the old world, but none of this grand scale. It was a work of art, and it was but the floor. Everything about the palace was exquisite. Shops were set back under a mezzanine to each side. Some of them looked to sell items travelers might want. There was a variety of small food and drink stands, everything from hot meat pies to sweets to ale to warm milk. Some places sold night clothes, others sold hair ribbons. Even at this late hour, some of the shops were still open and doing brisk business. In a place such as this, there would be people who worked at night and would have need of such shops. The places that offered to do up a woman's hair or paint her face or promised to do wonders with her fingernails were all closed until morning. Anne doubted they could pull off wonders with her. The woman cleared her throat as they strolled down the broad corridor, gazing at the shops to each side. And where have you traveled from? Oh, far to the south, very far. Anne took note of the woman's focused attention as she leaned in a bit. My sister lives here, Anne said, giving the woman something more to chew on. I'm here to visit my sister. She advises Lord Rawl on important matters. The woman's eyebrows lifted. Really? An advisor to Lord Rawl himself? What an honor for your family. Yes, Anne drawled. We're all proud of her. What does she advise him on? Advise him on? Oh, well, matters of war. The woman's mouth fell open. A woman? Advising Lord Rawl on warfare? Oh, yes, Anne insisted. She leaned over and whispered. She's a sorceress. Sees into the future, you know. Why, she wrote me a letter and told me she saw me coming to the palace for a visit. Isn't that amazing? The woman frowned a bit. Well, that does seem rather remarkable, since here you are and all. Yes, and she told me that I'd meet a helpful woman. The woman's smile returned. It again looked forced. She sounds to be quite talented. Oh, you have no idea, Anne insisted. She is so specific in her forecasts about the future. Really? Had she anything else to say about your visit then? Anything specific? Oh, yes, indeed. Why, do you know that she told me I would meet a man when I came here? The woman's gaze flicked around the halls. There are a lot of men here. That hardly seems very specific. Surely she must have said more than that. I mean, if she is so talented. And an advisor to Lord Rawl and all. Anne put a finger to her lip, frowning in feigned effort at recollection. Why, yes, she did, now that you mention it. Let's see if I can remember... Anne laid a hand on the woman's arm in a familiar manner. She tells me about my future all the time. My sister is always telling me so many things about my future in her letters that I sometimes feel as if I'm having trouble catching up with my own life. I sometimes have trouble remembering it all. Oh, do try, the woman said, eager for the gossip. This is so fascinating. Anne returned the finger to her lower lip as she gazed at the ceiling, pretending to be engaged in deep thought, and noticed for the first time that the ceiling was painted like the sky with clouds and all. The effect was quite clever. Well, Anne finally said, when she was sure she had the woman's full attention, my sister said that the man I would meet was old, she returned the hand to the woman's arm, but very distinguished, not old and decrepit, but tall, very tall, with a full head of white hair that comes all the way down to his broad shoulders. She said that he would be clean-shaven, 
and that he would be ruggedly handsome with penetrating dark as your eyes. Dark as your eyes. My, my, the woman tittered. But he does sound handsome. And she said that when he looks at a woman with those hawk-like eyes of his, their knees want to buckle. That is precise, the woman said, her face getting flushed. Too bad she didn't know this handsome fellow's name. Oh, but she did. What kind of advisor to the Lord Raw would she be if she wasn't talented enough to know such things? She told his name, too? She can really do such tellings of the future? Oh, my, yes, Anne assured her. She strolled along for a time, watching people making their way up and down the hall, stopping at some of the shops that were still open or sitting on benches, gossiping. And, the woman asked, what is the name your sister foretold? The name of this tall, distinguished gentleman. Anne frowned up at the ceiling again. It was N something, Nigel or Norris or something. No, wait, that wasn't it. Anne snapped her finger and thumb. The name, she said, was Nathan. Nathan, the woman repeated, looking almost as if she had been ready to pluck the name off Anne's tongue if she didn't spit it out. Nathan. Yes, that's it, Nathan. Do you know anyone here at the palace by that name, Nathan? A tall fellow, older, with long white hair, broad shoulders, as your eyes? The woman peered up at the ceiling and thought. This time it was Anne leaning in, waiting for word, watching intently for any reaction. A hand seized Anne's dress at her shoulder and brought her to an abrupt halt. Anne and the woman turned. Behind them stood a very tall woman with a very long blonde braid with very blue eyes, wearing a very dark scowl, and an outfit of very red leather. The woman beside Anne went as pale as vanilla pudding. Her mouth fell open. Anne forced her own mouth to stay shut. We've been expecting you, the woman in red leather said. Behind her, back up the hallway a short distance, spread out to block the hall, stood a dozen perfectly huge men in perfect leather armor carrying perfectly polished swords, knives, and lances. Why, I think you must have me mistaken for I don't make mistakes. Anne wasn't nearly as tall as the blonde woman in red leather. She hardly came up past the yellow crescent and star across her stomach. No, I don't suppose you do. What's this about? Anne asked, losing the timid, innocent tone. Wizard Rall wants us to bring you in. Wizard Rall? Yes, Wizard Nathan Rall. Anne heard a gasp from the woman beside her. She thought the woman was going to faint and so took hold of her arm. Are you all right, my dear? She stared wide-eyed at the woman in red leather glowering down at her. Yes, I have to go. I'm late. I must go. Can I go? Yes, you had better go, the tall blonde said. The woman dipped a quick bow and muttered good night before scurrying off down the hall, looking over her shoulder only once. Anne turned back to the scowl. Well, I'm glad you found me. Let's be off to see Nathan. Excuse me, Wizard Rall. You won't be having an audience with Wizard Rall. You mean not tonight. I won't be having an audience with him tonight. Anne was being as polite as she could, but she wanted to clobber that troublesome man or wring his neck, and the sooner the better. My name is Nida, the woman said. Pleased to meet, do you know what I am? She didn't wait for Anne to answer. I am Mord Sif. I give you this one warning as a courtesy. It is the only warning or courtesy you will receive, so listen closely. You came here with hostile intent against Wizard Rall. You are now my prisoner. Use of your magic against the Mord Sif will result in the capture of that magic by me or one of my sister Mord Sif, and its use as a weapon against you. A very, very unpleasant weapon. Well, Anne said, in this place my magic is not very useful, I'm afraid. Hardly worth a hoot, as a matter of fact. So you see, I'm quite harmless. I don't care how useful you find your magic. If you try to so much as light a candle with it, your power will be mine. I see, Anne said. Don't believe me? Nida leaned down. 
I encourage you to try to attack me. I haven't captured a sorceress's magic for quite a while. Might be fun. Thank you, but I'm a bit too tired out from my travels and all to be attacking anyone just now. Maybe later? Nida smiled. In that smile, Anne could see why Mord Sith were so feared. Fine, later then. So what is it you intend to do with me in the meantime, Nida? Put me up in one of the palace's fine rooms? Nida ignored the question and gestured with a tilt of her head. Two of the men a short way back up the hall rushed forward. They towered over Anne like two oak trees. Each grasped her under an arm. Let's go, Nida said as she marched off down the hall ahead of them. The men started out after her, pulling Anne along with them. Her feet seemed to touch the floor only every third or fourth step. People in the hall parted for the moored Sith. Passers-by pressed themselves up against the walls to the side a goodly distance away. Some people disappeared into the open shops from where they peered out windows. Everyone stared at the squat woman in the dark dress being hauled along by the two palace guards in burnished leather and gleaming mail. Behind, she could hear the jangle of metal gear as the rest of the men followed along. Page 206. They turned into a small hall to the side, going back between columns, holding a projecting balcony. One of the men rushed forward to unlock the door. Before she knew it, they'd all swept through the little door like wine through a funnel. The corridor beyond was dark and cramped, nothing like the marble-lined hallways most people saw. Not far down the hall, they turned down a stairway. The oak treads creaked underfoot. Some of the men handed lanterns forward so Nida could light her way. The sound of all the footsteps echoed back from the darkness below. At the bottom of the steps, Nida led them through a maze of dirty stone passageways. The seldom used halls smelled musty and in places damp. When they reached another stairwell, they continued down a square shaft with landings at each turn, descending into the dark recesses of the People's Palace. Anne wondered how many people in the past were taken by routes such as this, never to be seen again. Richard's father, Darkin Rall, and his father before him, Panis, were rather fond of torture. Life meant nothing to men such as those. Richard had changed all that. But Richard wasn't at the palace now. Nathan was. Anne had known Nathan for a very long time, for nearly a thousand years. For most of that time, as prelate, she had kept him locked in his apartments. Prophets could not be allowed to roam free. Now, though, this one was free. And worse, he had managed to establish his authority in the palace, the ancestral home of the House of Rall. He was an ancestor to Richard. He was a Rall. He was a wizard. Anne's plan suddenly started to seem very foolish just catch the prophet off guard, she'd thought. Catch him off guard and snap a collar back around his neck. Surely there would be an opening and he would be hers again. It had seemed to make sense at the time. At the bottom of the long descent, Nida swept to the right, following a narrow walk with a stone wall soaring up on the right and an iron railing on the left. Anne gazed off over the railing, but the lantern light showed nothing but inky darkness below. She feared to think how far it might drop, not that she had any ideas of a battle with her captors, but she was beginning to worry that they just might heave her over the edge and be done with her. Nathan had sent them, though. Nathan, as irascible as he could sometimes be, wouldn't order such a thing. Anne considered, then, the centuries she had kept him locked away considered the extreme measures it had sometimes taken to keep that incorrigible man under control. Anne glanced over the iron rail again, down into the darkness. Will Nathan be waiting for us, she asked, trying to sound cheerful. I'd really like to talk to him. We have business we must discuss. Nida shot a dark look back over her shoulder. Nathan has nothing to talk to you about. At an uncomfortably narrow passageway tunneling into the stone on the right, Nida led them into the darkness. The way the woman rushed lent a frightening aspect to an already frightening journey. 
Anne at last saw light up ahead. The narrow passageway emptied into a small area where several halls converged. Ahead and to the right, they all funneled down steep stairs that twisted as they descended. As she was prodded down the stairs, Anne gripped the iron rail, fearful of losing her footing, although the big hand holding a fistful of her dress at her right shoulder would probably preclude any chance of falling, to say nothing of running off. In the passageway at the bottom of the stairs, Nida, Anne, and the guards came to a halt under the low-beamed ceiling. Wavering light from torches in floor stands gave the low area a surreal look. The place stank of burning pitch, smoke, stale sweat, and urine. Anne doubted that any fresh air ever penetrated this deep into the people's palace. She heard a hacking cough echoing from a dim corridor to the right. She peered into that dark hall and saw doors to either side. In some of the doors, fingers gripped iron bars in small openings. Other than the coughing, no sound came from the cells holding hopeless men. A big man in uniform waited before an iron-bound door to the left. He looked as if he might have been hewn from the same stone as the walls. Under different circumstances, Anne might have thought that he was a pleasant enough looking fellow. Nida, the man said by way of greeting. When his eyes turned back up after a polite bow of his head, he asked in his deep voice, What have we here? A prisoner for you, Captain Lerner. Nida seized the empty shoulder of Anne's dress and hauled her forward as if showing off a pheasant after a successful hunt. A dangerous prisoner. The captain's appraising gaze glided briefly over Anne before he returned his attention to Nida. One of these secure chambers, then? Nida nodded her approval. Wizard Rall doesn't want her getting out. He said she's no end of trouble. At least half a dozen curt responses sprang to mind, but Anne held her tongue. You had better come with us, then, Captain Lerner said, and see to her being locked in behind the shields. Nida tilted her head. Two of her men dashed forward and pulled torches from stands. The captain finally found the right key from a dozen or so he had on a ring. The lock sprang open with a strident clang that filled the surrounding low corridors. It sounded to Anne like a bell being tolled for the condemned. With a grunt of effort, the captain tugged the heavy door, urging it to slowly swing open. In the long hallway beyond, Anne saw but a couple of candles bringing meager light to the small openings in doors to each side. Men began hooting and howling like animals, calling vile curses at who might be entering their world. Arms reached out, clawing the air, hoping to net a touch of a passing person. The two men with torches swept into the hall right behind Nida, the firelight illuminating her in her red leather, so all those faces pressed up against the openings in their doors could see her. Her Aegeal, hanging on a fine chain at her wrist, spun up into her fist. She glared at the openings in the doors to each side. Filthy arms drew back in. Voices fell silent. Anne could hear men scurry to the far recesses of their cells. Nida, once certain there would be no misbehavior, started out again. Big hands shoved Anne forward. Behind, Captain Lerner followed with his keys. Anne pulled the corner of her shawl over her mouth and nose, trying to block the sickening stench. The captain took a small lamp from a recess, lit it from a candle to the side, and then stepped forward to unlock another door. In the low passageway beyond, the doors were spaced closer together. A hand covered with infected lesions hung limp out of one of the tiny openings to the side. The hall beyond the next door was lower and no wider than Anne's shoulders. She tried to slow her racing heart as she followed the rough, twisting passageway. Nida and the men had to stoop, arms folded in, as they made their way. Here, Captain Lerner said as he came to a halt. He held up his lantern and peered into the small opening in the door. On the second try, he found the right key and unlocked the door. He handed his small lamp to Nida, and then used both hands to pull the lever. He grunted and tugged with all his weight until the door grated partway open. He squeezed around the door and disappeared inside. 
Nida handed in the lamp as she followed the captain in. Her arm, sheathed in red leather, came back out to seize a fistful of Anne's dress and drag her in after. The captain was opening a second door on the other side of the tiny room. Anne could sense that this was the room containing the shield. The second door grated open. Beyond was a room carved from solid bedrock. The only way out was through the door, and the outer room that contained the shield, and then the second door. The house of Rawl knew how to build a secure dungeon. Nida's hand gripped Anne's elbow, commanding her into the room beyond. Even Anne, as short as she was, had to duck as she stepped over the high sill to get through the doorway. The only furniture inside was a bench carved from the stone of the far wall itself, providing both a seat and a bed off the floor. A tin ewer full of water sat on one end of the bench. At the opposite end was a single folded brown blanket. There was a chamber pot in the corner. At least it was empty, if not clean. Nida set the lamp on the bench. Nathan said to leave you this. Obviously, it was a luxury the other guests weren't afforded. Nida stepped one leg over the sill, but paused when Anne called her name. Please give Nathan a message for me, please. Tell him that I would like to see him. Tell him that it's important. Nida smiled to herself. He said you would say those words. Nathan is a prophet. I guess he would know what you would say. And will you give him that message? Nida's cold blue eyes looked to be weighing Anne's soul. Nathan said to tell you that he has a whole palace to run and can't come running down to see you every time you clamor for him. Those were almost the exact words she had sent down to Nathan's apartments countless times when a sister had come to her with Nathan's demands to see the prelate. Tell Nathan that I have a whole palace to run and I can't go running down there every time he bellows for me. If he has had a prophecy, then write it down and I will look it over when I have the time. Until that moment, Anne had never truly realized how cruel her words had been. Nida pulled the door shut behind her. Anne was alone in a prison she knew she could not escape. At least she was near the end of her life and could not be held as a prisoner for nearly her entire life as she had held Nathan prisoner for his. Anne rushed to the little window. Nida! The moored Sif turned back from the second door from beyond the shield Anne could not cross. Yes? Tell Nathan... Tell Nathan that I'm sorry. Nida let out a brief laugh. Oh, I think Nathan knows you're sorry. Anne thrust her arm through the door, reaching toward the woman. Nida, please, tell him. Tell Nathan that I love him. Nida stared at her a long moment before she pushed the outer door closed. Chapter 21 Kaylin lifted her head. She gently laid a hand on Richard's chest as she turned her ear toward the sound she'd heard off in the darkness. Beneath her hand, Richard's chest rose and fell with his labored breathing, but even at that, she felt relief. He was still alive. As long as he was alive, she could fight to find a solution. She wouldn't give him up. They would get to Nietzsche. Somehow they would get to her. A quick glance to the position of the quarter moon told her that she'd been asleep less than an hour. Clouds, silvery in the moonlight, had silently begun streaming in from the north. In the distant sky, she saw, too, the moonlit wings of the black-tipped races that always trailed them. She hated those birds. The races had been following them ever since Kara had touched the statue of Kalin that Nietzsche said was a warning beacon. Those dark wings were never far, like the shadow of death, always following, always waiting. Kalin recalled all too well the sand in that hourglass statue trickling out. Her time was running out. She had no actual indication of what would happen when the time that sand had represented finally ran out, but she could imagine well enough. The place where they had set up camp, before 
a sharp rise of rock with a stand of bristlecone pine and thorny brush to one side wasn't as protected or tenable a camp as any of them would have liked. But Kara had confided that she was afraid that if they didn't stop, Richard wouldn't live the night. That whispered warning had set Kaylin's heart to pounding, brought cold sweat to her brow, and swept her to the verge of panic. She had known that the rough wagon ride, slow as it had been while they made their way across open country in the dark, seemed to have made it more difficult for Richard to breathe. Less than two hours after they had started out, after Kara's warning, they'd been forced to stop. After they had stopped, they were all relieved that Richard's breathing became more even and sounded a little less labored. They needed to make it to Rhodes so that traveling would be easier on Richard and so they could make better time. Maybe after he rested the night, they could make swifter progress. She had to fight constantly to tell herself that they would get him there, that they had a chance, and that the journey's purpose wasn't merely empty hope meant to forestall the truth. The last time Kaylin had felt this helpless, felt this sense of Richard's life slipping away, she'd at least had one solid chance available to her to save him. She'd had no idea at the time that that one chance taken would be the catalyst that would initiate a cascade of events that would begin the disintegration of magic itself. She was the one who had made the decision to take that chance. And she was the one responsible for all that was now coming to pass. Had she known what she now knew, she would have made the same decision to save Richard's life, but that made her no less liable for the consequences. She was the mother confessor, and as such, was responsible for protecting the lives of those with magic, of creatures of magic. And instead, she might very well be the cause of their end. Kaylin sprang to her feet, sword in hand, when she heard Kara's whistled bird call to alert them to her return. It was a bird call Richard had taught her. Kaylin slid the shutter on the lantern open all the way to provide more light. She saw Tom, hand resting on the silver-handled knife at his belt, rise from the nearby rock, where he'd been sitting as he watched over both the camp and the man Kaylin had touched with her power. The man still lay on the ground at Tom's feet where Kaylin had ordered him to stay. What is it? Jensen whispered as she appeared at Kaylin's side, hastily rubbing the sleep from her eyes. I'm not sure yet. Kara signaled, so she must have someone with her. Kara walked in out of the darkness, and as Kaylin had suspected, she was pushing a man ahead of her. Kaylin frowned, trying to recall where she'd seen him before. She blinked then, realizing it was the young man they had come across a week or so back. Owen. I tried to get to you sooner, Owen cried out when he saw Kaylin. I swear I tried. Holding him by the shoulder of his light coat, Kara marched the man closer, then yanked him to a halt in front of Kalin. What are you talking about? Kalin asked. When Owen caught sight of Jensen standing behind Kalin's shoulder, he paused with his mouth hanging open for an instant before he answered. I meant to get to you earlier, I swear, he said to Kalin, sounding on the verge of tears. I went to your camp. He clutched his light coat closed at his chest as he began to tremble. I, I saw, I saw all the remains. Dear Creator, how could you be so brutal? Kalin thought Owen looked like he might throw up. He covered his mouth and closed his eyes as he shook. If you mean all those men, Kalin said, they tried to capture us, to kill us. We didn't collect them from their rocking chairs beside their hearths and bring them out into this wasteland where we slaughtered them. They attacked us, we defended ourselves. But, dear creator, how could you? Owen stood before her, unable to control his shivering. He closed his eyes. Nothing is real, nothing is real, nothing is real. He repeated it over and over, as if it were an incantation meant to protect him from evil. Kara forcibly dragged Owen back a bit and sat him down on a shelf of rock. Eyes closed meditatively. He mumbled, nothing is real to himself continuously, while Kara took up a position to the left side of Kalin. Tell us what you're doing here, 
Kara commanded in a low growl. Although she didn't say it, the or else was clear enough. And be quick about it, Kalin said. We have enough trouble and we don't need you added on top of it. Owen opened his eyes. I went to your camp to tell you about it, but all those bodies... We know about what happened back there. Now tell us why you're here. Kaylin was at the end of her patience. I'm not going to ask you again. Lord Rall, Owen wailed, tears bursting forth at last. Lord Rall what? Kaylin demanded through gritted teeth. Lord Rall has been poisoned, he blurted out as he wept. Goose flesh prickled up Kaylin's legs. How can you possibly know such a thing is true? Owen stood, clutching twisted wads of his coat at his chest. I know, he cried, because I'm the one who poisoned him. Could it be? Could it be that it wasn't really the runaway power of the gift killing Richard, but poison? Could it be that they had it all wrong? Could it be that it was all caused by this man poisoning Richard? Kaylin felt her sword's hilt slip from her fingers as she started for the man. He stood watching her come like a fawn watching a mountain lion about to leap. Kaylin knew there was something strange about this man. Richard, too, had thought there was something unsettling about him, something not quite right. Somehow, this quaking stranger had poisoned Richard. Richard barely hung to life. He was suffering and in pain. This man had been the cause of it all. Kalin would know why, and she would know the truth of it. Kalin closed the distance quickly. She would not risk his escape. She would not risk his lies. She would have his confession. Her hand started coming up toward him. Her power was recovered. She could feel it there in the core of her being at the ready. This man had tried to kill Richard. She intended to find out if there was a way to save him. This man could tell her. She committed herself to taking him. It was not necessary for Kalin to invoke her birthright, but merely to withdraw her restraint of it. Her feelings about what this man had done faded away. They no longer mattered in this. Only the truth would serve her now. She was a being of raw commitment. He had no chance. He was hers. She saw him standing frozen, watching her come, saw his blue eyes widen, saw the tears running down his cheeks. Kalin felt the cold coil of power straining for release, demanding to be freed. As her hand rose toward this man who had harmed Richard, she wanted nothing so much as what she would have. He was hers. Kara abruptly jumped in between them. Kalin's sight of the man was blocked by the moored Sith. Kalin tried to brush Kara aside, but she was ready and firmly held her ground. Kara seized Kalin by the shoulders and forced her back three paces. No, Mother Confessor, no. Kalin was still focused on Owen, even if she couldn't see him. Get out of my way. No, stop. Move. Kalin tried to shove Kara aside, but the woman had her feet spread and couldn't be budged. Kara, no, listen to me. Kara, get out of... She shook Kalin so hard that Kalin thought her neck would snap. Listen to me! Kalin panted in rage. What? Wait until you hear what he says. He came here for a reason. When he finishes, you can use your power if you want, or you can let me make him scream until the moon covers its ears. But first, we need to hear what he says. I'll find out soon enough what he says, and I'll know the truth. When I touch him, he will confess every detail. And if Lord Rall dies as a result, Lord Rall's life hanging in the balance. We must think of that first. I am. Why do you think I'm going to do this? Kara pulled Kalin close to hear her whisper. And what if using your power on this man kills him for some reason we don't yet even know about? Remember when we didn't know everything in the past? Remember Marlon Picard announcing he had come to assassinate Richard? It was too easy then, and it's too easy this time. What if your touching this man is someone's design, a trick with this man sent as bait of some sort? 
What if they want you to do it for some reason? What if you do what they intend you to do, then what? It won't be a simple mistake that we can work to fix. If Lord Rall dies, we can't bring him back. Kara's fierce blue eyes were wet. Her powerful fingers dug into Kaelin's shoulders. What can it hurt to hear him first before you touch him? You can then touch him if you still think it's necessary, but hear him first. Mother Confessor, as a sister of the Aegeal, I'm asking you, please, for the sake of Lord Rall's life, wait. More than anything, it was Kara's reluctance to use force that gave Kalen pause. If there was anyone who would be more than willing to use physical force to protect Richard, it was Kara. In the dim light of the lantern, Kalen studied the emotion in Kara's expression. Despite everything Kara said, Kalen didn't know if she could afford to take the chance to hesitate. What if it's a stab in the dark? Jensen asked from behind. Kalen glanced back over her shoulder at Richard's sister, at the worry on her face. Kalen had made a mistake before in not acting quickly enough, and it resulted in Richard being captured and taken from her. Then it was his freedom. This time, it was his life at stake. She knew that while hesitation had been a mistake in that instance, that didn't mean that immediate action was always right. She looked back into Kara's eyes. All right, we'll hear what he has to say. With a thumb, she brushed a tear from Kara's cheek, a tear of terror for Richard, a tear of terror at the thought of losing him. Thanks, Kalen whispered. Kara nodded and released her. She turned and folded her arms, fixing Owen in her glare. You had better not make me sorry for stopping her. Owen peered about at all the faces watching him. Friedrich, Tom, Jensen, Kara, Kalen, and even the man Kalen had touched, lying on the ground not far away. In the first place, how could you possibly have poisoned Richard? Kalen asked. Owen licked his lips, fearful of telling her, even though that was apparently why he had returned. His gaze finally broke toward the ground. When I saw the dust rising from the wagon, and I knew that I was near, I dumped out what water I had left, so it would appear I had none. Then, when Lord Rall found me, I asked for a drink. When he gave me his water skin so I could have a drink, I put poison in it, just before I handed it back. I was relieved that you had showed up too. It was my intention that I poison both Lord Rall and you, Mother Confessor, but you had your own water and didn't take a drink when he offered it to you. But I guess it doesn't matter. This will work just as well. Kalen couldn't make sense of such a confession. So you intended to kill us both, but you were only able to poison Richard. Kill? Owen looked up in shock at the very idea. He shook his head emphatically. No, no, nothing like that, Mother Confessor. I tried to get to you earlier, but those men went to your camp before I got there. I needed to get the antidote to Lord Rall. I see. You wanted to save him after you'd poisoned him, but when you got to our camp, we'd gone. His eyes filled with tears again. It was so awful, all the bodies, the blood. I've never seen such brutal murder. He covered his mouth. It would have been murder, our murder, Kalen said, had we not defended ourselves. Owen seemed not to hear her. And you were gone, you'd left. I didn't know where you'd gone. It was hard to follow your wagon's trail in the dark, but I had to. I had to run to catch up with you. I was afraid the races would get me, but I knew I had to reach you tonight. I couldn't wait. I was afraid, but I had to come. The whole story was nonsense to Kalen. So you're like one of those people who starts a fire, calls out an alarm, and then helps put it out? Also, you can be a hero. Startled, Owen shook his head. No, no, nothing like that. Nothing like that at all, I swear. I hated doing it. I did. I hated it. Then why did you poison him? Owen twisted his light coat in his fists as tears trickled down his cheeks. Mother Confessor, we have to give him the antidote now or he will die. It's already so very late. He clasped his hands prayerfully and gazed skyward. Dear Creator, let it not be too late, please. 
Kaczynski reached out for Kalin, as if to urgently beg her as well to assure her of his sincerity, but at the look on her face drew back. There's no more time, Mother Confessor. I tried to get to you earlier, I swear. If you don't let him have the remedy now, it will be the end of him. It will all be for naught, everything, all of it, all for nothing. Kalin didn't know if she dared trust in such an offer. It made no sense to poison a man and then save him. What's the antidote, she asked. Here, Owen hurriedly pulled a small vial from a pocket inside his coat. Here it is. Please, Mother Confessor. He held the square-sided vial out toward her. He must have this now. Please hurry or he will die. Or this will finish him, Kalin said. If I wanted to finish him, I could have done so when I slipped the poison into his water skin. I could have used more of it, or I could simply not have come with the antidote. I'm not a killer, I swear. That's why I had to come in the first place. Owen wasn't making a whole lot of sense. Kalin wasn't confident in such an offer. It was Richard's life that would be forfeit if she chose wrong. I say we give Richard Owen's antidote, Jensen whispered. A stab in the dark? Kalin asked. You said that there were times when there is no choice but to act immediately. But even then, it must be with your best judgment, using all your experience and everything you do know. Earlier in the wagon, I heard Kara tell you that she didn't know if Richard would live the night. Owen says he has an antidote. I think this is one of those times we must act. If it means anything, Tom offered in a confidential tone, I'd have to agree. I don't see as there really is any choice. But if you have an alternative that might save Lord Rall, I think now would be the time to add it to the stew. Kalin didn't have any alternative, except getting to Nietzsche, and that was looking more and more like no more than empty hope. Mother Confessor, Friedrich offered in a hushed tone, I agree as well. I think you should know that if you let him have the remedy, we all were in agreement that it was the best choice to be made. If the antidote killed Richard, they wouldn't blame her. That was what he was saying. Jensen stepped toward Owen, pulling Betty along with her. If you're lying about this being an antidote, you will have to answer to me, and to Kara, and then to the mother confessor, if there's even anything left of you by then. You do understand that, don't you? Owen shrank from her, his head turned away, as he nodded vigorously, apparently fearing to look up at her or at Betty. Kalin thought that he looked more afraid of Jensen than of any of the rest of them. Kara leaned toward Kalin and whispered, He has to have an antidote. What purpose would it be to place himself in danger of all we'll do to him if he's lying? Why even come back here, if he only wanted to poison Lord Rall? He had already poisoned him and gotten away. Mother Confessor, I say that we give Lord Raw the antidote and we do it quickly. Then why poison him in the first place? Kalin whispered back. If you intend to give a man the antidote, then why poison him? Kara let out a frustrated sigh. I don't know, but right now, if Lord Raw dies... Kara's words trailed off at the unthinkable. Kalin looked over at Richard, lying unconscious. She went weak at the thought of him never waking. How could she live in a world without Richard? How much do we give him, she asked Owen. Owen rushed forward, past Jensen. All of it. Make him drink it all down. He pressed the small, square-sided bottle into Kalin's hands. Hurry! Please hurry! You've hurt him, Kalin said with unrestrained menace. Your poison hurt him. He's been coughing up blood, and he passed out from the pain. If you think I'll ever forget that and be pleased with you for now returning to save his life, you're wrong. Owen nervously licked his lips. But I tried to get to you. I was bringing you the antidote so that wouldn't happen. I never intended him such pain. I tried to get to you, but you slaughtered all those men. So it's our fault then? Owen smiled just a bit as he nodded, a small smile of satisfaction that she'd finally seen the light and at last understood that it wasn't his fault at all, but their fault. While Jensen watched Owen, keeping him back out of the way, Tom watched the man Kalin had touched, and Friedrich watched Betty,
Kalin and Kara knelt and lifted Richard so they would try to get him to drink the antidote. Kara propped his back against her thigh while Kalin cradled his head in her arm. She pulled the stopper with her teeth and spit out the cork. Careful not to spill and waste any of the antidote, she put the bottle to his lips and tipped it up. She watched it wet his lips. She tilted his head back more so that his mouth would fall open a bit and tipped the bottle some more. Carefully, she let some of the clear liquid dribble into his mouth. Kalin didn't know if what was in the bottle really was an antidote. It was colorless and looked to her just like water. As Richard smacked his lips a little, swallowing what she had poured in his mouth, Kalin smelled the bottle. The liquid had the slight aroma of cinnamon. She dribbled more of it into Richard's mouth. He coughed, but then swallowed. Kara used a finger to swipe up a drop that ran down his chin and return it to his mouth. Kalin, her heart pounding with worry, poured the rest of the liquid past his lips. Holding the empty bottle between her thumb and first finger, she used the palm of her hand to push Richard's jaw up, forcing his head back, forcing him to swallow. She sighed with relief when he swallowed several times, taking all the cure. At least she'd been able to get him to swallow it. Carefully, Kalin and Kara laid Richard back down. As Kara stood, Owen rushed forward. Did you give him all of it? Did he drink it all? Kara's Aegeel spun into her fist. As Owen, in his exuberance to get to Richard, charged forward, Kara rammed her Aegeel into Owen's shoulder. Owen tottered back a step. I'm sorry. He rubbed his shoulder where Kara had jabbed her Aegeel into him. I only wanted to see how he is. I don't mean any harm. I want him to be well, I swear. Kalin stared in astonishment. Kara glanced down at her Aegeel, then at Owen. Her Aegeel hadn't worked on him. He wasn't affected by magic. Even Jensen was staring at Owen. He was just like her, a pillar of creation, born pristinely ungifted and unaffected by magic. While Jensen understood what that meant, it didn't seem that Owen did. He had no idea that Kara had done anything more than poke him good and hard to get him to stand back. Her Aegeel should have dropped him to his knees. Richard drank all the antidote. Now it must do its work. In the meantime, I think we had better get some sleep. Kalin gestured with a tilt of her head. See to the watches, would you, Kara? I'll stay with Richard. Kara nodded. She gave Tom a look, which he understood. Owen, Tom said, why don't you come over by me and spend the night over here with this fellow? Owen blanched at the look on the face of the big Daharan and understood that he wasn't being offered a choice. Yes, all right, he turned back to Kalen. I'll pray that he got the antidote in time. I'll pray for him. Pray for yourself, she said. When everyone had gone, Kaylin lay down beside Richard. Now that she was alone with him, tears of worry finally began to seep out. Richard was shivering with cold, even though it was a warm night. She drew the blanket back up around him and then put her hand on his shoulder as she cuddled close, not knowing if when the new day came, he would still be with her. Chapter 22 Richard opened his eyes only to squint at the light, even though it was far from sunny. By the layered streaks of violet tinting the iron-gray sky, it appeared to be just dawn. A heavy overcast hung low overhead, or it could be sunset. He wasn't really sure. He felt strangely disoriented. The dull throbbing in his head ached back down through his neck. His chest burned with every breath he drew. His throat was raw. It hurt to swallow. The heavy pain, though, the pain that had squeezed so hard it had taken his breath and had made the world go black, seemed to have ebbed. The bone-chilling grip of cold had lifted, too. Richard felt as if he had lost contact with the world for a time, for how long a time he didn't know. It seemed like it had been an eternity, as if the world of life was a distant memory from his past. He also felt as if he had come close to never waking again. 
gasped and brought a flash of sweat to his brow to feel that he had been close to losing his life, to realize that he might never have awakened. The surroundings were different from those he remembered. Close by, a wall of straw-colored rock with sharp fractured edges rose nearly straight up. To the side, he saw a stand of twisted bristlecone pine. Pale, bare wood stood out in naked relief where sections of dark bark had peeled open. The imposing mountains loomed closer than he remembered, and there were more trees on the slopes of the nearby hills. Jensen lay curled up in a blanket beside Betty, her back against the rear wheel of the wagon. Tom was asleep not too far away, right beside his draft horses. Friedrich sat on a rock standing watch. Richard couldn't make sense of the two men who lay at Friedrich's feet. Richard thought one of them must be the man Kalin had touched with her power. The other one, though, he wasn't sure of, although Richard thought there was something familiar about him. Kalin was sound asleep up against him. His sword lay on his other side, close by his hand. On the other side of Kalin lay her sword, sheathed but at the ready. All the seekers who had used the sword of truth before Richard the good and the evil, had left within the sword's magic the essence of their skill. By mastering the sword as the true seeker for whom the makers of the sword intended its power, Richard had learned to tap that ability and make it his own, to draw on all the skill and knowledge of those before him. He had become a master of the blade in more ways than one, and part of that had come from the blade itself. Kaelin had been taught to use a sword by her father, King Wyborn Amnel, once king of Gallia, before Kaelin's mother had taken him for her mate. Richard had completed Kaelin's training, teaching her how to use a sword in ways she had never been shown, ways that used her size and speed to her best advantage, rather than fighting like the enemy and depending on strength. Despite his pounding head and the pain when he drew a breath, the warm feel of Kalin against his side brought him a smile. She looked so beautiful, even with her hair all in a tangle. She made his heart ache with longing. He had always loved her long, beautiful hair. He loved to watch her sleep almost as much as he loved to gaze into her arresting green eyes. He loved to make her hair a tangled mess. He remembered, back when he had first met her, watching her sleep on the floor of Addie's home, watching her slow heartbeat in the vein in her neck. He remembered as he'd watched being struck by the life in her. She was just so alive, so passionately filled with life. He couldn't stop smiling as he looked at her. Gently, he bent and kissed the top of her head. She stirred, nuzzling up tighter to him. Suddenly, she jerked upright, sitting on a hip, as she stared wide-eyed at him. Richard! She threw herself down beside him, her head on his shoulder, her arm across his chest. She clutched him for dear life. A single gasp of a sob that terrified him with its forlorn misery escaped her throat. I'm all right, he soothed, as he smoothed her hair. She pushed herself up again, slower, gazing at him as if she hadn't seen him in an eternity. Her special smile, the one she gave only him, spread incandescent across her face. Richard. She seemed only able to stare at him and smile. Richard, still lying back, trying to let his head clear, lifted an arm just enough to point. Who is that? Kaylin looked back over her shoulder. She turned back and took up Richard's hand. Remember that fellow a week or so back? Owen? That's him. I thought I recognized him. Lord Rall! Kara dropped to the ground on the side of him opposite Kalin. Lord Rall! She, too, seemed to have trouble finding words. Instead, she took up his free hand. That in itself said a world to him. Richard took the hand back, kissed his first two fingers, and touched the fingers to her cheek. Thanks for watching out for everyone. Jensen hobbled over, the blanket still tangled around her legs. Richard, the antidote worked. It worked. Dear spirits, it worked. Richard rose up onto an elbow. Antidote? He frowned at the three women around him. Antidote to what? You were poisoned, Kaylin told him. She aimed a thumb back over her shoulder. 
Owen, when he came to us the first time, you gave him a drink. In thanks, he put poison in your water skin. He intended to poison me with it, too, but only you drank it. Richard's glare settled on the men at Friedrich's feet, watching them. He nodded his confirmation that it was true, as if he should be commended for it. One of those little mistakes, Jensen said. Richard puzzled at her. What? You said that even you made mistakes, and even a little one could cause big trouble. Don't you remember? Kara said you were always making mistakes, especially simple ones, and that's why you need her around. Jensen flashed him a teasing smile. I guess she was right. Richard didn't correct the story, but said as he stood, it just goes to show how you can be taken by surprise by something as simple as that fellow over there. Kalen was watching Owen. I have a suspicion he isn't so simple. Kara put her arm out for Richard to grab hold of in order to steady himself. Kara, he said, as he had to sit down on a nearby crate from the wagon, bring him over here, would you? Gladly, she said, as she started across their camp. Don't forget to tell him about Owen, Kara said to Kalen. Tell me what? Kalen leaned close as she watched Kara haul Owen to his feet. Owen is pristinely ungifted, like Jensen. Richard raked his hair back, trying to make sense of it. Are you saying that he's also my half-brother? Kalen shrugged. We don't know that. We know only that he's pristinely ungifted. A wrinkle of puzzlement tightened on her brow. By the way, back at the camp where those men attacked us, you were about to tell me something important you figured out when we were questioning the man that I touched, but you never got the chance. Yes, Richard squinted, trying to recall what the man had told them. It was about the one he said gave the orders, sending them to capture us. Nicholas, Nicholas something. The slide, Kalen reminded him. Nicholas the slide. Right. Nicholas told him where to find us, at the eastern edge of the wasteland heading north. How could he know? Kalen mulled over the question. Come to think of it, how could he know? We've seen no one, at least no one we were aware of, who could have reported where we were. Even if someone had seen us, by the time they reported our position and Nicholas sent the men, we would have been far from here, unless Nicholas is close. The races, Richard said. It has to be that he's the one watching us through the races. We've seen no one else. That's the only way anyone could have known where we were. This Nicholas the Slide had to have seen us, to have seen where we were through those birds that have been shadowing us, that's how he was able to give our location along with the orders. Richard rose as the man approached. Lord Rall, Owen said, arms spread in a gesture of relief as he scurried forward, Kara holding a fistful of his coat at his shoulder to keep him reined in. I'm so relieved you're better. I never meant for the poison to hurt you as it did, and it never would have had you had the antidote sooner. I tried to get to you sooner. I meant to. I swear I did, but all oh, those men you slaughtered, it wasn't my fault. He added a small smile to the pleading expression he gave Kalen. The mother confessor knows, she understands. Kalen folded her arms as she looked up at Richard from under her frown. It's our fault, you see, that Owen didn't make it to us sooner with the antidote to the poison. Owen got to our last camp, intending to hand over the antidote to cure you, only to find that we had murdered all those men and then up and left. So it's not his fault. His intentions were good, and he tried. We spoiled his effort. Very inconsiderate of us. Richard stared, not sure if Kalen was giving him a sarcastic summation of what Owen had told her, or an accurate portrayal of Owen's excuse, or if his head still wasn't clear. Richard's mood turned as dark as the thick overcast. You poisoned me, he said to Owen, wanting to be sure he had the man's story straight. And then you brought an antidote to where we were camped, but when you got to that camp, you came across the men who had attacked us, and you found we had gone. Yes! His cheer that Richard had it right abruptly faded. Such savagery from the unenlightened is to be expected, of course. Owen's blue eyes filled with tears. 
but still it was so... He hugged himself and closed his eyes as he rocked his weight from side to side, from one foot to the other. Nothing is real, nothing is real, nothing is real. Richard seized the man's shirt at his throat and yanked him closer. What do you mean, nothing is real? Owen paled before Richard's glare. Nothing is real. We can't know if what we see, if anything, is real or not. How could we? If you see it, then how can you possibly think it isn't real? Because our senses all the time distort the truth of reality and deceive us. Our senses only delude us into the illusion of certainty. We can't see at night. Our sight tells us that the night is empty, but an owl can snatch up a mouse that with our eyes we couldn't sense was there. Our reality says the mouse didn't exist, yet we know it must, in spite of what our vision tells us, that another reality exists outside our experience. Our sight, rather than revealing truth, hides the truth from us. Worse, it gives us a false idea of reality. Our senses deceived us. Dogs can smell a world of things we can't because our senses are so limited. How can a dog track something we can't smell if our senses tell us what is real and what isn't? Our understanding of reality, rather than being enhanced by, is instead limited by our flawed senses. Our bias causes us to mistakenly think we know what is unknowable. Don't you see? We aren't equipped with adequate senses to know the true nature of reality, what is real and what isn't. We only know a tiny sampling of the world around us. There is a whole world hidden from us, a whole world of mysteries we don't see, but it's there just the same, whether we see it or not, whether we have the wisdom to admit our inadequacies to the task of knowing reality or not. What we think we know is actually unknowable. Nothing is real. Richard leaned down. You saw those bodies because they were real. What we see is only an apparent reality, mere appearances, a self-imposed illusion all based on our flawed perception. Nothing is real. You didn't like what you saw, so you choose instead to say it isn't real? I can't say what's real. Neither can you. To say otherwise is unenlightened arrogance. A truly enlightened man admits his woeful ineffectiveness when confronting his existence. Richard pulled Owen closer. Such whimsy can only bring you to a life of misery and quaking fear, a life wasted and never really lived. You had better start using your mind for its true purpose of knowing the world around you instead of abandoning it to faith in irrational notions. With me, you will confine yourself to the facts of the world we live in, not fanciful daydreams as concocted by others. Jensen tugged on Richard's sleeve, pulling him back to hear her as she whispered, Richard, what if Owen is right? Not necessarily about the bodies, but about the general idea. You mean you think his conclusions are all wrong, and yet somehow the convoluted idea behind them must be right? Well, no. But what if what he says really is true? After all, look at you and me. Remember the conversation we had a while back? The one where you were explaining how I was born without eyes to see? She glanced briefly at Owen and apparently abbreviated what she had intended to say. Certain things. Remember that you said that, for me, such things don't exist. That reality is different for me. That my reality is different than yours. You're getting what I said wrong, Jensen. When most people get into a patch of poison ivy, they blister and itch. Some rare people don't. That doesn't mean the poison ivy doesn't exist, or more to the point that its existence depends on whether or not we think it's there. Jensen pulled him even closer. Are you so sure? Richard, you don't know what it's like to be different from everyone else, to not see and feel what they do. You say there's magic, but I can't see it or feel it. It doesn't touch me. Am I to believe you on faith when my senses say it doesn't exist? Maybe because of that I can understand a little better what Owen means. Maybe he doesn't have it all wrong. It makes a person wonder what's real and what's not, and if, like he says, it's only your own point of view. The information our senses give us must be taken in context. 
If I close my eyes, the sun doesn't stop shining. When I go to sleep, I'm consciously unaware of anything. That doesn't mean that the world ceases to exist. You have to use the information from your senses in context, along with what you've learned to be true about the nature of things. Things don't change because of the way we think about them. What is, is. But like he says, if we don't experience something with our own senses, then how can we know it's real? Richard folded his arms. I can't get pregnant, so would you argue that for me, women don't exist? Jensen backed away, looking a little sheepish. I guess not. Now, Richard said, turning back to Owen, you poisoned me, you admit that much. He tapped his fist against his own chest. It hurts in here, that's real. You caused it. I want to know why, and I want to know why you brought the antidote. I'm not interested in what you think of the camp where the men who attacked us lay dead. Confine yourself to the matter at hand. You brought the antidote for the poison you gave me. That can't be the end of it. What's the rest? Well, Owen stammered, I didn't want you to die. That's why I saved you. Stop telling me your feelings about what you did and tell me instead what you did and why. Why poison me and why then save me? I want the answer to that and I want the truth. Owen glanced around at the grim faces watching him. He took a breath as if to gather his composure. I needed your help. I had to convince you to help me. I asked before for your help and you refused. Even though my people have great need, I begged. I told you how important it was for them to have your help, but you still said no. I have my own problems I must deal with, Richard said. I'm sorry the order invaded your homeland. I know how terrible that is, but I told you, I'm trying to bring them down, and our doing so will only help you and your people in your effort to rid yourselves of them. You aren't the only one who has had their home invaded by those brutes. We have men of the order murdering our loved ones as well. You must help us first, Owen insisted. You and those like you, the unenlightened ones, must free my people. We can't do it ourselves. We are not savages. I heard what you all had to say about eating meat. Such talk made me ill. Our people are not like that. We can't be, because we are enlightened. I saw how you murdered all those men back there. I need you to do that to the order. I thought that wasn't real. Owen ignored the question. You must give my people freedom. I already told you I can't. Now you must. He looked at Kara, Jensen, Tom, and Friedrich. His gaze settled on Kalen. You must see to it that Lord Raal does this or he will die. I have poisoned him. Kalen seized Owen's shirt. You brought him the antidote to the poison. Owen nodded. That first night when I told you all of my great need, I had just given him the poison. His gaze returned to Richard. You had just drunk it within hours. Had you agreed to give my people the freedom they need, I would have given you the antidote then, and you would be free of the poison. I would have cured you. But you refused to come with me to help those who cannot help themselves, as is your duty to those in need. You sent me away, so I did not offer you the antidote. In the time since, the poison has worked its way through your body. Had you not been selfish, you would have been cured back then. Instead, the poison is now established in you, doing its work. Since it was so long since you drank the poison, the antidote I had with me was no longer enough to cure you, only to make you better for a while. And what will cure me? Richard asked. You will have to have more of the antidote to rid you of the rest of the poison. And I don't suppose you have any more. Owen shook his head. You must give my people freedom. Only then will you be able to get more of the antidote. Richard wanted to shake the answers out of the man. Instead, he took a breath, trying to stay calm so that he could understand the truth of what Owen had done and then think of the solution. Why only then, he asked. Because, Owen said. The antidote is in the place taken by the Imperial Order. You must rid us of the invaders if you are to be able to get to the antidote. If you want to live, you must give us our freedom. If you don't, you will die. Chapter 23
Kaylin reached in to seize Owen by the throat. She wanted to strangle him, to choke him, to make him feel the desperate, panicked need of breath that Richard had endured, to make him suffer, to show him what it was like. Kara went for Owen as well, apparently having the same thought as Kalen. Richard thrust his arm out, holding them both back. Holding Owen's shirt in his other fist, Richard shook the man. And how long do I have until I get sick again? How long do I have to live before your poison kills me? Owen's confused gaze flitted from one angry face to another. But if you do as I ask, as is your duty, you will be fine, I promise. You saw that I brought you the antidote. I don't wish to harm you. That is not my intent, I swear. Kalen could only think of Richard in crushing pain, unable to breathe. It had been terrifying. She couldn't think of anything else but him going through it again, only this time never to wake. How long, Richard repeated. But if you only... How long? Owen licked his lips. Not a month. Close to it, but not a month, I believe. Kalen tried to push Richard away. Let me have him. I'll find out. No, Kara pulled Kalen back. Mother confessor, she whispered. Let Lord Rahl do as he must. You don't know what your touch would do to one such as he. It might do nothing, Kalen insisted but it might still work, and then we can find out everything. Kara restrained her with an arm around her waist that Kalen could not pry off. And if only the subtractive side works and it kills him? Kalen stopped struggling as she frowned at Kara. And since when have you taken up the study of magic? Since it might harm Lord Ra. Kara pulled Kalen back farther away from Richard. I have a mind too, you know. I can think things through. Are you using your head? Where is this city? Where is the antidote within the city? What will you do if using your power kills this man and you are the one who condemns Lord Raal to death when you could have had the information we need had you not touched him? If you want, I will break his arms, I will make him bleed, I will make him scream in agony, but I will not kill him. I will keep him alive so that he can give us the information we need to rid Lord Rahl of this death sentence. Ask yourself, do you really want to do this because you believe it will gain you the answers we need, or because you want to lash out, to strike out at him? Lord Rahl's life may hang on you being truthful with yourself. Kaelin panted from the effort of the struggle, but more from her rage. She wanted to lash out, to strike back, just as Kara said to do whatever she could to save Richard and to punish his attacker. I've had it with this game, Kalen said. I want to hear the story, the whole story. So do I, Richard said. He lifted the man by his shirt and slammed him down atop the crate. All right, Owen, no more excuses for why you did this or that. Start at the beginning and tell us what happened and what you and your people did about it. Owen sat trembling like a leaf. Jensen urged Richard back. You're frightening him, she whispered to Richard. Give him some room, or he will never be able to get it out. Richard took a purging breath as he acknowledged Jensen's words with a hand on her shoulder. He walked off a few paces, standing with his hands clasped behind his back as he stared off in the direction of the sunrise, toward the mountains Kalen had so often seen him studying. It had been on the other side of the range of the smaller, closer mountains, tight in the shadows of those massive peaks thrusting up through the iron-gray clouds where they had found the warning beacon and first encountered the black-tipped races. The clouds that capped the sky all the way to the wall of those distant peaks hung heavy and dark. For the first time since Kalen could remember, it looked like a storm might be upon them. The expectant smell of rain quickened the air. Where are you from? Richard asked in a calm voice. Owen cleared his throat as he straightened his shirt and light coat, as if rearranging his dignity. He remained seated atop the crate. I lived in a place of enlightenment, in a civilization of advanced culture, a great empire. Where is this noble empire? Richard asked, still staring off into the distance. Owen stretched his neck up, looking east. He pointed at the far wall of towering peaks where Richard was looking. There, 
Do you see that notch in the high mountains? I lived past there, in the empire beyond those mountains. Kalin remembered asking Richard if he thought they could make it over those mountains. Richard had been doubtful about it. He looked back over his shoulder. What's the name of this empire? Bandakar, Owen said in a reverent murmur. He smoothed his blonde hair to the side as if to make himself a respectable representative of his homeland. I was a citizen of Bandakar, of the Bandakaran Empire. Richard had turned and was staring at Owen in a most peculiar manner. Bandakar. Do you know what that name Bandakar means? Owen nodded. Yes. Bandakar is an ancient word from a long time forgotten. It means the chosen, as in the chosen empire. Richard seemed to have lost a little of his color. When his eyes met Kalin's, she could see that he knew very well what the word meant, and Owen had it wrong. Richard seemed to suddenly remember himself. He rubbed his brow in thought. Do you, do any of your people know the language that this ancient word Bandakar is from? Owen gestured dismissively. We don't know of the language, it's long forgotten. Only the meaning of this word has been passed down because it is so important to our people to hold on to the heritage of its meaning. Chosen empire. We are the chosen people. Richard's demeanor had changed. His anger seemed to have faded away. He stepped closer to Owen and spoke softly. The Bandakaran Empire, why isn't it known? Why does no one know of your people? Owen looked away toward the east, seeing his distant homeland through wet eyes. It is said that the ancient ones, the ones who gave us this name, wanted to protect us because we are a special people they took us to a place where no one could go because of the mountains all around. Such mountains as only the Creator could impose to close off the land beyond so that we are protected. Except that one place, Richard gestured east. That notch in the mountain range, that pass. Yes, Owen admitted, still staring off toward his homeland. That was how we entered the land beyond, our land but others could enter there as well. It was the one place where we were vulnerable. You see, we are an enlightened people who have risen above violence, but the world is still full of savage races. So those ancient people who wanted our advanced culture to survive, to thrive without the brutality of the rest of the world, they sealed the pass. And your people have been isolated for all this time, for thousands of years. Yes. We have a perfect land, a place of an advanced culture that is undisturbed by the violence of the people out here. How was the pass, the notch in the mountains, how was it sealed? Owen looked at Richard, somewhat startled by the question. He thought it over a moment. Well, the pass was sealed. It was a place that no one could enter because they would die if they entered this boundary. With an icy wave of understanding, Kalin suddenly understood what composed the seal to this empire. Well, yes, Owen stammered, but it had to be that way to keep outsiders from invading our empire. We reject violence unconditionally. It's unenlightened behavior. Violence only invites ever more violence spiraling into a cycle of violence with no end. He fidgeted with the worry of such a trap catching them up in the allure of its wicked spell. We are an advanced race above the violence of our ancestors. We have grown beyond, but without the boundary that seals that pass, and until the rest of the world rejects violence as we have, our people could be the prey of unenlightened savages. And now that seal is broken. Owen stared at the ground, swallowing before he spoke. Yes. How long ago did the boundary fail? We aren't sure. It is a dangerous place. No one lives near it, so we can't be positive. But we believe it was close to two years ago. Kalin felt the dizzying burden of confirmation of her fears. When Owen looked up, he was a picture of misery. Our empire is now naked to unenlightened savages. 
Sometime after the boundary came down, the imperial order came in through the pass. Yes. The land beyond those snow-capped mountains, the empire of Bandakar, is where the black-tipped races are from, isn't it, Richard said. Owen looked up, surprised that Richard knew this. Yes, those awful creatures, innocent though they are of malice, prey on the people of my homeland. We must stay indoors at night when they hunt. Even so, people, especially children, are sometimes surprised and caught by those fearsome creatures. Why don't you kill them? Kara asked indignantly. Fight them off, shoot them with arrows. Dear spirits, why don't you bash their heads in with a rock if you have to? Owen looked shocked by the very suggestion. I told you we are above violence. It would be even more wrong to commit violence on such innocent creatures. It is our duty to preserve them, since it is we who entered into their domain. We are the ones who bear the guilt because we entice them into such behavior, which is only natural to them. We preserve virtue only by embracing every aspect of the world without the prejudice of our flawed human views. Richard gave Kara a stealthy gesture to be quiet. Was everyone in the Empire peaceful? he asked, pulling Owen's attention away from Kara. Yes. Weren't there occasionally those who, I don't know, misbehaved? Children, for example. Where I come from, children can sometimes become rowdy. Children where you come from must sometimes become rowdy, too. Owen shrugged a bit with one shoulder. Well, yes, I guess so. There were times when children misbehave and become unruly. And what do you do with such children? Owen cleared his throat, plainly uncomfortable. Well, they are put out of their home for a time. Put out of their home for a time, Richard repeated. He lifted his arms in a questioning shrug. The children I know will usually be happy to be put outside. They simply go play. Owen shook his head emphatically at the serious nature of the matter. We are different. From the time we are born, we are together with others. We are all very close. We depend on one another. We cherish one another. We spend all our waking hours with others. We cook and wash and work together. We sleep in a sleeping house together. Ours is an enlightened life of human contact, human closeness. There is no higher value than being together. So, Richard asked, feigning a puzzled look, when one of you, a child, is put out, that is a cause of unhappiness? Owen swallowed as a tear ran down his cheek. There could be nothing worse. To be put out, to be closed off from others, is the worst horror we can endure. To be forced out into the cold cruelty of the world is a nightmare. Just talking about such a punishment, thinking about it, was making Owen start to tremble. And that's when sometimes the races get such children, Richard said in a compassionate tone, when they're alone and vulnerable. With the back of his hand, Owen wiped the tear from his cheek. When a child must be put out to be punished, we take all possible precautions. We never put them out at night, because that is when the races usually hunt. Children are put out for punishment only in the day. But when we are away from others, we are vulnerable to all the terrors and cruelties of the world. To be alone is a nightmare. We would do anything to avoid such punishment. Any child who misbehaves and is put out for a while will not likely misbehave again anytime soon. There is no greater joy than to finally be welcomed back in with our friends and family. So, for your people, banishment is the greatest punishment. Owen stared into the distance. Of course. Where I come from, we all got along pretty well, too. We enjoyed each other's company and had great fun when many people would gather. We valued our times together. When we're away for a time, we inquire about all the people we know and haven't seen in a while. Owen smiled expectantly. Then you understand, Richard nodded, returning the smile. But occasionally there will be someone who won't behave even when they're an adult. We try everything we can, but sometimes someone does something wrong something they know is wrong. They might lie or steal. 
Even worse, at times, someone will deliberately hurt another person, beat someone when robbing them, or rape a woman, or even murder someone. Owen wouldn't look up at Richard. He stared at the ground. As he spoke, Richard paced slowly before the man. When someone does something like that, where you come from, Owen, what do your people do? How do an enlightened people handle such horrible crimes some of your people commit against others? We attack the root cause of such behavior from the beginning, Owen was quick to answer. We share all we have to make sure that everyone has what they need so that they don't have to steal. People steal because they feel the hurt of others acting superior. We show these people that we are no better than they, and so they need not harbor such fears of others. We teach them to be enlightened and reject all such behavior. Richard shrugged nonchalantly. Kalin would have thought that he would be ready to strangle the answers out of Owen, but instead he was behaving in a calm, understanding manner. She had seen him act this way before. He was the seeker of truth, rightfully named by the first wizard himself. Richard was doing what seekers did, find the truth. Sometimes he used his sword, sometimes words. Even though this was the way Richard often disarmed people when he questioned them, in this case it struck Kalin that such a manner was precisely what Owen would be most accustomed to, most comfortable with. This gentle manner was pulling answers from the man and filling in a lot of information Kalin had never thought of trying to get. She had already learned that she was the cause of what had befallen these people. We both know, Owen, that try as we might, such efforts to change people's ways don't always work. Some people won't change. There are times when people do evil things. Even among civilized people, there are some who will not behave in a civil manner, despite all your best efforts. What's worse is that if allowed to continue, these few jeopardize the whole community. After all, if you have a rapist among you, you can't allow him to continue to prey on women. If a man committed murder, you couldn't allow such a man to threaten the empire with his ways, now could you? An advanced culture, especially, can't be faulted for wanting to stop such dangers to enlightened people. But you've shunned all forms of violence, so you can't hardly punish such a man physically. You couldn't put a murderer to death not if you've truly rejected violence unconditionally. What do you do with such men? How does an enlightened people handle grave problems such as murder? Owen was sweating. It seemed not to have occurred to him to deny the existence of murderers. Richard had already led him past that, had already established the existence of such men. Before Owen could think to object, Richard was already beyond to the next step. Well... Owen said, swallowing. As you say, we are an enlightened people. If someone does something to harm another, they are given a denunciation. A denunciation. You mean you condemn their actions, but not the man. You give him a second chance. Yes, that's right. Owen wiped sweat from his brow as he glanced up at Richard. We work very hard to reform people who make such mistakes and are given a denunciation. We recognize that their actions are a cry for help, so we counsel them in the ways of enlightenment in order to help them to see that they are hurting all our people when they hurt one, and that since they are one of our beloved people, they are only hurting themselves when they hurt another. We show such people compassion and understanding. Kalin caught Kara's arm and with a stern look convinced her to remain silent. Richard paced slowly before Owen, nodding as if he thought that sounded reasonable. I understand. You put a great deal of effort into making them see that they can never do such a thing again. Owen nodded, relieved that Richard understood. But then there are times when one of those who has received a denunciation and has been counseled to the very best of your ability, goes out and does the same crime again, or even worse. It's clear then that he refuses to be reformed and that he's a threat to public order, safety, and confidence. Left to his own devices, such a person by himself will bring the very thing you unconditionally reject, violence. 
to stalk among your people and win others to his ways. A light mist had begun to fall. Owen sat on the crate, trembling, frightened, alone. Only a short time ago, he had been reluctant to answer even the most basic question in a meaningful way. Now Richard had him speaking openly. Friedrich stroked the jaw of one of the horses as he quietly watched. Jensen sat on a rock, Betty lying at her feet. Tom stood behind Jensen, a hand resting gently on her shoulder, but keeping an eye on the man Kalin had touched with her power. That man sat off to the side, listening dispassionately as he waited to be commanded. Kara stood beside Kalin, ever watchful for trouble, but obviously caught up in the unfolding story of Owen's homeland, even if she was having a hard time holding her tongue. For her part, Kaylin, while she could sympathize with Kara's difficulty in holding her tongue, was transfixed by the tale of a mysterious empire that Richard casually, effortlessly drew from this man who had poisoned him. She couldn't imagine where Richard was going with his matter-of-fact questions. What did this empire's forms of punishment have to do with Richard being poisoned? It was clear to her, though, that Richard knew where he was headed and that the path he was following was wide and sunlit. Richard paused before Owen. What do you do in those instances when you can't reform someone who has become a danger to everyone? What do an enlightened people do with that kind of person? Owen spoke in a soft voice that carried clearly in the misty early morning hush. We banish them. Banish them. You mean you send them into the boundary? Owen nodded. But you said that going into the boundary is death. You couldn't simply send them into the boundary, or you would be executing them. You must have a place to send them through, a special place. A place where you can banish them without killing them, but a place where you know they can never return to harm your people. Owen nodded again. Yes, there is such a place. The pass that is blocked by the boundary is steep and treacherous, but there is a path that leads down into the boundary. Those ancient ones who protected us by placing that boundary placed the path as well. The path is said to allow passage out because of the way the mountain descends. It is a difficult path, but it can be followed. And just because of how difficult it is, it's not possible to climb back up to enter the Bandakaran Empire. Owen chewed his lower lip. It goes down through a terrible place, a narrow passageway through the boundary, a lifeless land where it is said that death itself lies to each side. The person banished is given no water or food. He must find his own on the other side or perish. We place watchers at the entrance of the path where they wait to be sure that the one banished has gone through and is not lingering in the boundary only to return. The watchers wait and watch for several weeks to be sure that the one banished has gone beyond in search of water and food, in search of his new life away from his people. Once beyond, the forest is a terrible place, a frightening place, with roots that descend over the edge like a land of snakes. The path takes you down under that cascade of roots and running water. Then even lower you find yourself in a strange land where the trees are far above reaching for the distant light, but you see only their roots twisting and stretching down into the darkness toward the ground. It is said that once you see the forest of roots towering all around you, you have made it through the boundary and the pass through the mountains. There is said to be no way to enter our land from that other side, to use the pass to return to our empire. Once banished, there is no redemption. Richard moved up close beside Owen and placed a hand on his shoulder. What did you do to be banished, Owen? Owen sank forward, putting his face in his hands as he finally broke down sobbing. Chapter 24 Richard left his hand on Owen's shoulder as he spoke in a compassionate tone. Tell me what happened, Owen. Tell me in your own way. Kalin was startled to hear after all help was given and yet become one of the banished. She saw Jensen's jaw fall open. Kara lifted an eyebrow. 
Kalen could see that Richard's hand on Owen's shoulder was an emotional lifeline for the man. He finally sat up, sniffling back the tears. He wiped his nose on his sleeve. He looked up at Richard. Should I tell you the whole story? All of it? Yes, I'd like to hear it all from the beginning. Kalen was struck at how much Richard reminded her at that moment of his grandfather, Zed, and the way Zed always wanted to hear the whole story. Well, I was happy among my people, with them all around me. They held me to their breast when I was young. I was always safe in their welcoming arms. While I knew of other children who became unruly and were put out as punishment, I never did anything to be put out. I hungered to learn to be like my people. They taught me the ways of enlightenment. For a time, I served my people as the wise one. Later, my people were pleased with how enlightened I was, how I embraced them all, and so they made me the speaker of our town. I traveled to nearby towns to speak the words of what the people of my town all believed as one. I went to our great cities for the same reason. I was always happiest, though, when I was home with my closest people. I fell in love with a woman from my town. Her name is Marilee. Owen stared off into his memories. Richard didn't rush him, but waited patiently until he began again at his own pace. 